<laughs> All right, well, we'll reconvene now our Amory Board of Education meeting for a regular meeting. And the first thing we'll do is give us a Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, so now we're going to have our community engagement session and the school district Amory Board of Education will discuss the district science curriculum order for the grades K through 8. The Board of Education invites and encourages feedback from and discussion with the community regarding this topic. No action will be taken by the school district of Amory Board of Education on this topic as part of this community engagement session. Community feedback on all other topics is reserved for community comments. So with that, I'll hand it over. Jessica is going to point this effort. All right, good evening. So in our curriculum adoption cycle, K-8 science is up. So we actually will move to make those purchases July 1st. So our K-8 science reps have taken the last year to evaluate different curriculum resources and different curriculum supports. And so what you see in front of you is a lot of paper. Um, you have a copy of the slideshow that Becky and I will walk through together. And then you also have documentation of spreadsheets. In those spreadsheets, it itemizes what is up for purchase. The K-5 purchases look very different than the 6-8, just based on the content and the standards that we are teaching to. So I'm going to ask Mrs. Melberg and Mr. Wolf to come on up. Um, they're going to share with you um, any, any additional big purchases, or if you have any questions, you can direct them towards them. So, um, Becky, if you don't mind going on to the next one. So the next couple slides that you will see are mostly resources. At the K-5 levels, we use something called EIE, or FOSS kits. Um, those have been in our curriculum cycles, rotation, and support for quite some time over last, I would say, at least since our last cycle, they've been in, in use. So with that, they tie to certain standards, but they are consumable pieces that are in there as well. So what you see in front of you is a lot of those consumable pieces. So um, this is four Ks. Becky, if you don't mind. Um, kindergarten, you can see on here, for example, baking soda, yarn, tissue paper. As I said, a lot of those are just replacing the things that are already in our kits. Um, the kits are stored in each of the buildings, and so part of Mr. Wolf and Mrs. Melberg's job over the last year was to inventory what was in there to make sure that what we purchase lasts for the, last, for the next seven years. And you can see the kits are on top. They're, they're the most costly thing. Otherwise, it's mostly Amazon consumables. And if you want to go all the way to the end, Becky... Also separated out is Children's House. So we have um, Children's House, Montessori, Montessori Children's House, Montessori Lower Elementary, and then Montessori Upper Elementary. While they utilize a lot of the same kits, they do have different resources that they need to use for their Montessori alignment. So those slides were all of the consumable pieces. A couple new kits were on there as well. Um, and then this is a digital resource slide. So you, as you can see, we purchase digital resources K-5. We actually already use these three tools. So the first is Mystery Science, which is a subscription for seven years, Generation Genius, and we are seeking a subscription for seven years, and then Scholastic News, which is about 50% social studies, 50% science that our teachers utilize. So if you have any questions on either the digital tools or even the resources that are within those first few slides or in your itemized list, you know, um, Andy and Jen would be happy to answer them, or I would be happy to as well. I have a question, um, but I don't know if it's for you or if it's for John. When you have something like this that is a relatively large expense, but it's over seven years, are you amortizing it each year, or is it a one-time cost, or how's it going? So that kind of just depends. Um, Gatsby 97 came out about a year ago now. Um, and that's on the school-based information technology agreement side. So now we are legally bound to amortize all the digital that is over a one-year subscription. We're, we're required to capitalize and amortize that over at least a seven-year period. As far as the consumables are just consumables. So 
I, I think the answer is is a little bit of both. I think you're looking at about half of that is amortized services, and the rest of it is just consumable. So it just becomes a budget item. Correct. We'll see. Okay. One of the things that's later in our, our board meeting is a new curriculum cycle rotation. So we've adjusted it to a seven-year cycle versus a 10-year cycle, which I'm sure was easier in planning your consumables to um, plan for what are you buying for seven years versus 10. And so that's where we went with the seven-year subscriptions. We struggled in the past when we were asking for anything really longer than a seven-year. Most companies were saying they would not give us any quotes beyond that. So you're getting, you're getting new content during that seven years, right? You're not buying something that is static. Right. So the kits um, are, are kits that they stay the same, right? And they align to our standards. And there are a lot of them are discovery. So one is like a, there's a bridge one, right? Um, there's... I think we have a like, hand pollinator kit that we do. And it's all through discovery, learning about how bugs pollinate with flowers from one thing to the next. And it's uh, all that stuff. It's consumables, but the... The kit itself stays the same. We learn the same thing year after year sure. because it aligns with all of our standards. And I would say for the digital tools, Mystery Dog, for example, as they record new uh, lessons, those get embedded in what we're doing. So they're added, same with Generation Genius. Those are added on as they go. The great thing about both of those resources, too, is that they do align with standards. So as a teacher, if I'm Mr. Wolf and I want to find a new resource for a certain standard, I can actually go into both of those resources and search by standard, and it'll shoot out those lessons that you should then be presenting to your students. How do we address um, cost changes um, for over the course of the seven years? Like you have things in here like coffee filters and string and those kind of things. Obviously, you're going to be replacing those things every year. How is that accounted for? So we are purchasing all of those right now. Okay. So when they come, um, if it's coffee filters, they will get enough coffee filters in the middle of July to last them for seven years. And we're thankful for our big storage units that we can store all of the supplies in. And then the digital resources, that's our quote for seven years. So that won't vary. That'll stay the same. A lot of work mm -hmm. went you. into this. A lot of work. Thank you. Um, thank you for the purchasing. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the preparation for time. all that. That's it. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's a that's a lot just to <coughs> look up all of this it stuff is. and do the price shopping and the comparisons and where you can get it the cheapest. And I mean, these are this is hours worth of work invested here. <coughs> so thank you for being so prepared and. Um, the cost in mind for the district, so I appreciate that. And I will say they each led their building, which was great. Mm -hmm. They worked with their grade level science rep, but they really led the charge of each of their buildings. Um, you will see we allotted certain amounts for the 6-8 and the K-5. One caveat I always like to share is these are Amazon prices, and so we leave a little bit of a buffer knowing that the coffee filters could be more than what you know second grade found them at six months ago. So it is nice to have that little bit of a buffer there as well. Thank you. Good job. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> all right. And next is our 6 eight. So we have all three of our middle school science teachers here. They would like to come on up. And you will see the same. Theirs looks a little bit different. They um, utilize a lot of the same resources. And so you will see, again, it's a spreadsheet laying out each of their different resources. On here, there's more than one. Um, you'll see the first one is um, 211 Advanced Placement Microscope by National Optics. Then we have Elevate Science, grade 7, or 6, 7, and 8. And then on the last page, you will see Kessler Science, and then grade 8 Digital Skills Graduated Cylinders as well. <coughs> And they had the same process as K-5 then, taking a year to be able to vet their resources. Um, we met multiple times, and we also met with the Curriculum Oversight Committee last month to review and go over any questions. So if you have any questions, I'm sure these three ladies would be able to answer them. Or myself. Perhaps they want to review did you get your CDs at the meeting? I did. So it's very similar to what we currently have in 6th and 7th grade. 
Um, we use Pearson Interactive Science. Pearson essentially merged and is Savvis Learning now. Um, and so the student versions are consumable. Um, so we get a shipment every year. Uh, and uh, Steve, to your question about upgraded material, because we've had this before, um, they, ha they do make upgrades. And so, you know, not every year necessarily, uh, but we did in our last cycle of, I think it was 11 years, um, there, there were updates made, which is pretty cool that we aren't just stuck with a big honking textbook for, you know, well, now seven years, but what was 11 years. So they're module based, so sixth grade is getting one module uh, for ourselves and then seventh, sixth and seventh grade will share one of the texts because they changed how they have some of their content um, and so after I use it in sixth grade um, then I will collect them, pass them along to Ariel for seventh grade. Um, for her to continue to use, which is pretty nice. Eighth grade had something different last go round, um, but they have modules that will work for how we're um, redoing a few things in eighth grade um, to match needs at the high school to get the kids ready to go in there. So we're pretty excited about it. So you have like um, these consumable books like this. So, th so when you have a science lesson, can you just walk us through like what that would look like? Is like you have a, a obviously a teacher's manual here, and it coincides with <clears throat> excuse me the consumable that the the student has, and then do you guys lead the lessons based on this? Like if somebody would like back in the day they would pull up a hardcover science book and then, or is this is this a daily? Is this daily instruction? Is this? I think it varies from teacher mm -hmm. to teacher. Um, there are things that like we'll use, we'll read aloud as a class, and we'll go through different problem solving activities. There's a lot of things built in here. Like they're called um, in the old books, they were called like apply it or do the maths, where they would like. It's a nice opportunity for you to read about something, and then you would say, "All right, let's um, pair up with our table partners and let's work through the do the math, and then you guys can work through that as a class afterwards." So they just have nice um, activities integrated within it that coincide with the text. They're certainly just a resource. There's other things that we're going to use. Um, if you back up one slide. You can kind of see the design here. We would start with some engaging activity. Um, we can move on to exploring, which would be a variety of these types of things. So labs, interactivities, there could be virtual labs. Um, and then we move into, this is kind of what Ariel was just describing with these different, like model it, design it. Um, so you can kind of pick and choose the avenue for the topic you're teaching, uh, which is kind of neat that it's a little bit versatile that way. The nice thing about having this is that sometimes students are pulled at the younger ages for like their RTI time. So by the time they get to middle school, it might be some of their first times in science, or just in general, a lot of new terminology. So for them to have this to reference back to for that terminology aspect is really helpful. And did, did the consumable workbooks or books, do those stay at school? Or do those get to go home? Do we have trouble with them coming back and no. kids no. having no. them? Okay. No. They I've, are assigned to, like the student will get the consumable. So it will yep. be theirs for the whole year. Um, but I don't have any troubles with them. And I've done it a variety of ways with send home, keep here. It, they're pretty responsible about it. Okay. So what we just looked at here is like basically three years of. of, of so you're seeing modules from each of the grade levels. We got a lot of stuff here. Yeah, yeah. earth yeah. and yeah. structures and forces. Yeah. So. It's, yeah. So yeah. basically three three years of, of activities here, right? Wow. Right. Uh, yeah, a lot of stuff. Interesting stuff. I, who knew science was so interesting? <laughs> this is just kind of a design of uh, the whole program showing uh, what the, there's always an essential question that we're starting with. Um, phenomenon based digital resources. Again, back to the essential question, hands on lab. So just kind of highlighting how it's designed. Um, an additional resource, we've been using this for the last three mm -hmm. years. Um, Kessler Science has, it's 
created by a middle school science teacher, has awesome activities that are just a supplemental to what we're also teaching in the classroom. Um, I use it a lot for like escape challenges where they can work in groups or inquiry labs to get the lessons started or to get the unit started. Um, I really like it. They're constantly updating their stuff year after year as well. So every time I see something that's like coming soon, I'm like, sweet. <laughs> And I use the wiki tickets quite a bit, um, really working on looking at different ways to display data and such and getting students used to that. Wiki tickets have a lot of that, um, gets to higher depth of knowledge, and really creates a lot of good conversation as well. Gail's graduated cylinders and microscopes. Those were some of the tools that they had on um, the second spreadsheet. So with that, that brings us to the K-8 summary. So as you can see, K-5 um, coming in at that price point, and then 6-8 with equipment and resources coming in at that price point. 6-8 um, is considering possibly adding another tool within uh, their budget. That's something that Mr. Benson and I um, will take a look at and have conversation with them. And so when we seek final board approval next month, I would bring that to you and I would present on what that is. These What's listed here uh, with the quantities? Is that for? So year? that's for one year, yep. And so we looked at student numbers coming in um, for this next year. We do have the ability to adjust our numbers each year. They have a text portal that each summer we can go in and adjust. Um, but this is where we, what we started with based on numbers coming in. Okay. questions what was our allotted total for curriculum purchase one four under good you guys <laughs> all right well thank you thank very you. much yep. <clears throat> Does anyone from the audience have any comments or questions for anybody on the curriculum purchase? That's good. There's no band-aids listed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. They're on hand all the time. <laughs> It's, it's obviously money that we spend for instruction all the time. So it's, it's our <coughs> amount. And yep, and this is a byproduct of the 2017 referendum where the price went from 100000 to 140000 So this has been in place for, what, seven years? And Jessica will talk in a little bit about the revised version. What well, we're discovering, not to steal her thunder, is 11 years is simply too long to keep a certain subject area stagnant for 11 years until they get to order again. And further, uh, we're not finding uh, folks that will enter into arrangements with us that are 11 years in length. Yeah. Textbook companies and, and e-textbook companies will not allow us to do that. There are terms of length. There are five, six, seven at most, not 11. So we'll talk more later. <coughs> Anyone else? I suppose we could just take a break till 6.30 then. Okay. And we'll have our meeting at 6.30. Right. I think we can roll so right. We can roll keep going. Roll. Can we? Yeah, it's, it's um, posted that way. Does it say continued? Way. Okay. Sweet. All right. It is posted, though. Josh right. is trying to get on by his bed. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nine o'clock is it, Josh? We gotta get to bed. Yeah. <laughs> Eight thirty. Oh. All right. So then we will have our consent agenda items. I had the consent agenda <coughs> items for tonight. Uh, all the vouchers looked in order. The minutes looked in order, and everything looked hunky dory as usual. So I'll make a motion to accept the uh, consent agenda items as presented. And a second. Second. Neil. All in favor say aye. Was, uh, uh, what? was there uh, there was like two thousand dollars 
for was that out of referendum? Two thousand dollars to Dick's Market was that for storage or what was it? Yep, that? that's been a storage price that we've had for basically since the beginning of the referendum. We had no place to put our stuff when we removed it, and Dick's did. Thank you. So I mean, <laughs> we were basically out of luck unless we were going to put it out in the snow. Yeah, thank you. That's all. You're welcome. Okay. All right. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. There we go. Next, Josh. I'll let you go. All right. At the high school, uh, late January, early February, we had our traditional snow week activities for the week, but uh, there was no snow outside, but the kids had a lot of fun with the activities, and student council always does a great job of planning those activities out. Um, last week, we had our academic and career planning conferences at the high school for 9th through 12th grade. Uh, the focus on that is helping our students pick out uh, potential courses for next year. The master schedule isn't built, but we're still basing that off of the data from what the students are interested in. And then for our seniors, we're talking about um, scholarships and school choices and potential careers after high school. So those are really productive meetings. Uh, the remodel has shifted to the art, ag, and tech edge area, education areas. We're looking probably um, shortly after spring break, that phase should be done. And then moving into the northeast corner of the high school, the science math area. <coughs> Uh, future events, our winter sports playoffs are uh, currently ongoing. Um, we have three sectional champion wrestlers, one runner-up. They'll be competing at state uh, Saturday. We've got um, everybody else basically is playing this week for playoff games to get in. Uh, it's National FFA Week. Um, if you haven't uh, received an email from Derek with the uh, cow judging contest, um, that's always a fun thing to participate in. Um, we have our ACT Boot Camp Day coming up on February 27th for grades 9 through 11. Um, we dive all in on our best efforts, kind of prepping the tests, students for tests. Um, February 28th and 29th, we have our teen screen mental health check for ninth graders. That's an optional attendee. Uh, information has been sent out to ninth grade parents if they want their son or daughter to participate in the screening. Uh, March 12th, we have the Junior ACT Day. Um, that's a really big day, and of course, with the remodel and stuff going on, we've kind of been limited into the area where we can have students this year for that test, and the workers have agreed to be very quiet that day, so we won't have any problems. And then on uh, March 13th through the 22nd, we have our foreign language trip um, going to Spain, France, and Italy. We have, I think, 30, 34 students and six chaperones, so heading to Europe. So, uh, All right, at the middle school, our students are right now involved in, <clears throat> excuse me, working on their student individual goals. And basically what they're doing there is they're, they've set goals at the beginning of the year that they want to accomplish. And so this is a mid-year check-in with their advisors and they're talking about some of the things and changes in their study habits that they maybe want to make or um, things that they're interested in and they set goals for themselves and they'll be processing with their advisor on how they're doing towards that. Um, quiz bowl is coming up. Uh, we're about, we have it uh, tomorrow, and I think uh, we'll be having the championship round on March 13th. They're about halfway through, and they're pretty excited about that. That's a sixth grade competition. Genius Hour has kicked off, and the students now are meeting with uh, Warrior Times about once a week is allocated, um, one of the days, and they're working on their passion project and something that they want to research and learn more about, and then they'll be presenting at the, the end of the year on May 10th. We just got students back on Thursday at the middle school solo and ensemble contest. So they've been working on their um, small little ensembles or their individual solos. And uh, they had a really, really successful event on Thursday. Um, they competed in Somerset. And uh, was very proud that every single student received a one or two rating. And there's four site rooms, the four core rooms, and we received, Amory Middle School had three of the four best on-site awards. So that was really, really good to see that our kids were really succeeding. And um, I want to you know, give a round of applause to Carrie Moskell and to uh, Mrs. Rhodes Lundgren and to Mrs. Uh, Sunderland for all their work with those students. Uh, other important events, we got a winter dance coming up on February 22nd. February 26th is the end of our trimester two, so we'll be two-thirds way done with the year. I think that's next Monday. Um, March 4th, 
We have a parrot training, and I'm pretty excited about that. We've been doing a lot more parrot trainings in recent years with students. These are mostly um, parrots that work in the classroom alongside teachers to help students. And we have led some of the trainings have really been on, you know, like, here's a good skill, here's a way to approach students in a more proactive, positive way. Uh, this one's going to be more centered on just listening to some of their concerns and uh, they're providing us some, um, we're providing them a way to pr uh, send out some questions and things that they would like to talk about and then we'll be letting them kind of guide what they want to learn. And so we're doing that on uh, March 4th. March 5th is our final essentials class. And um, actually, we've had the final class. This will be more of a survey for the, all the new teachers will take a survey about how the year is going for them and the training and resources that we've provided for them to be successful in the classroom. And then we hit spring break. That's it at the middle school. I have a question, Tom. Y yep. The para training that you're doing, is that yeah. strictly for paras at the middle school or uh, district-wide? Well, there are different trainings that everyone's running with STEP, but this one's mm -hmm. for the middle school. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that, and the reasons we started it was um, middle school kids, some of them can be pr pretty edgy at times, and we had certain kids in how you approach that student and if there was a problem or how you're approaching them in the classroom to motivate them um, can be very different from one kid to another on what's going to work and how we can avoid issues. And so initial, some of our trainings were just on... Um, how to approach that and how to approach some high needs kids in a more productive and positive way. And obviously kind of what's going on with a middle school age kid is very different than a kindergarten or a senior in high school. So that's where our training started. But um, I don't, I, I think there's a good idea. Like we do a lot of trainings like um, how to um, intervene in, in a crisis and things. Some of those are uh, CPI trainings, those are district-wide for them, CPR trainings, but this one is just mostly for the middle school. And is that a um, professional-led workshop? No, this is, this is something that um, through the different trainings that we've had that um, I'm pretty much running with them along with Mrs. Weisenbeck at times is helping me plan out how we're going to approach and, and work with them. Thanks. Thanks yep. for doing that. Mm -hmm. All right. Intermediate elementary, we are continuing our work on the English language arts. We, as you remember, several years ago, adopted HMH into reading. And so this past month, we had a reading consultant from CESA 11 come and spend three full days. So each grade level got a half day with her. And at this point in rolling out our curriculum, the focus of the work over these past three days was actually rubric assessments and then alignment of the curriculum with our standards. We feel that we've provided our K-5 teachers with a lot of support in rolling out this ELA and it's, it will pay dividends. Our, our students are grasping concepts and we're developing really strong readers. Intermediate School hosted our third annual Love Your Library event this month. Um, I wanna thank our Love Your Library committee and the public library. Public library comes and children can sign up for library cards at that point. Mrs. Brayton reads some really great book talks and we give away different books and then families are invited to explore our library, read with their parent, and then explore our maker space as well. And then they end the night with hot chocolate and a sugar cookie. The Iditarod is a yearly unit that the fourth grade focuses on. If you remember, they wrote a grant for teachers and so this past summer they actually went and visited Alaska. So this is something that they are very passionate about. They are just coming into this unit, which I think is their favorite. Um, they welcomed in a guest speaker last week um, <coughs> who brought in a dog sled and pictures. Um, she's local to us, Laura Wycheck was here, and so she spent about an hour with our fourth grade students, and then actually students today Zoomed with a dog sled racer from Alaska and had the opportunity to ask her questions, so they really, really enjoyed that. Um, a big part of this is they do something called the I Did a Read, and so they are set up in teams and they read um, read the Iditarod Trail. They have different landmarks through their reading words and points that they can finish the trail on together. So it's, it's a fun unit for our teachers. They're passionate about it and it gets, gets kids really excited to read. We had parent-teacher conferences last week. I want to thank our IPO. They provided our meal Monday night um, and we had a really great turnout. We had a 95% attendance. 
In the morning on Thursday, we had a half day of in-service, and so during that time, I worked with grade levels on um, familiarizing them with something called Act 20, uh, which is more to come, and then also we worked on the forward as well. Some of our upcoming events, we have an IPO meeting coming up. We have the Youth Rec Fair March 4th. We are attending here at our high school. The Eau Claire Children's Theater is presenting the play The Cat in the Hat. March 7th, report cards will go home, and then another great fundraiser for us is March 12th. We have our family bingo night here at the Intermediate School. I think that I did a rod unit. Has, it's been around. This, this Intermediate School has been doing it for a long time, and I honestly think it's probably one of the coolest things that happens in the district, and I just, thanks to Laura for always being available to, to come in and share these experiences, and really just gives a small town perspective to these kids like it's just not out of your reach and it's just not in another world somewhere that you know it's really cool thanks Laura for doing that and right, I, the kids just seem to enjoy this year after year after year so it doesn't they, get old they do and I'm not quite sure if the teachers love it more or the kids do because our <laughs> fourth grade teachers are very passionate about it I did a read I did a read yep. <laughs> love it Good evening. So at the, or at the elementary school, we have a whole lot of fun things going on as well. Um, one thing that we did this past um, January was have an elementary school reading cafe for our family night. Um, we seated 150 people in our cafeteria and had a, a great time with just some different appetizers and main courses and desserts and it was jokes and poetry books and nonfiction and fiction books. It was just a really great time to be had that night. So it was really wonderful to have all those families there with us that night. And a, and a great thank you to our reading committee and um, Power Up for providing the snack that night. So it was it was just a great planning from, from those right in our building. Uh, we had our 4K students spend some time at the Amory Public Library. They enjoyed reading and having some incentives in the, in the play areas there with reading activities. As Jessica mentioned, we had Teresa Stanley here from CESA um, developing um, on our end some assessments that go along with our um, essential standards and then bringing that back into our report card information that's sent on to our parents at parent-teacher conferences, so that's nice. Wanted to pop back up to our winter benchmark testing. We did that here just before our um, trimester ended and so we got that fast bridge testing done so that's our second spot that we test during the school year we'll have one more um, come spring and that will be our comparison on our AGR report going forward we <coughs> celebrated our 100th day of school on February 2nd kindergarten followed that up with the 101st day of school um, they always do that they love being the 101 Dalmatians that day and they have a great load of fun um, with a lot of academic um, activities to go along with the 101st day. Our middle school eighth grade students did a fantastic job creating children's books and they came over to our school and they shared those with our students and our kiddos loved that. So we just appreciate those partnerships um, in the buildings and the middle school kids did such a wonderful job um, being with our students and sharing their book and their work and, and getting them excited to write as well. Um, annual trip to Trollhagen was one of the great things that we look forward to every year. And even though there was no snow, there really was a Trollhagen, and they had a great time sledding and just heard lots of fun stories when they returned. So that's always a great activity that's in part um, made available through our lean parent organization. So we thank them for helping to sponsor us on that fun day. And everybody came back in one piece. Everyone came back in one okay. piece. Having Sucks. a great time. Exactly. Exactly. So some of our upcoming events are February 22nd. We have our Youth Recreation Night at the high school um, for all of our area um, booster clubs. Um, February 26th, end of our trimester two. And we are also going to see Cat in the Hat at the Amory High School Auditorium um, on part of Eau Claire Children's Theater. Second grade music and art show is coming on March 5th. We're excited about that. And spring break on the 18th. Thank you. All right, just a, a couple brief updates on uh, student services. Um, one, and I don't want to steal Mr. Benson's thunder, but this is our district assessment coordinator 
um, update as well, but IDEA has a lot um, in play on it, and that's our joint federal notification packet. These are federal requirements um, that really just measure kind of the health of things like discipline disproportionality, um, inclusional practices, uh, graduation rates, testing participation, testing achievement, all around students with disabilities. And so I'm glad to report here tonight that uh, we are meeting all requirements. So um, what could we be doing otherwise? We could be not meeting the requirements. We could need assistance, need intervention, or need substantial intervention with respect to any of those numbers and those indicators on the uh, joint federal notification packet. So um, while this is not the only measure of, of health in a district in terms of, in terms of servicing students with disabilities, it's, it's a good indicator that you're well on your way. You, you wouldn't want to be um, working with this one and, and be on the list where, in particular, that you are at the needs assistance or need substantial intervention. So that's good news to report there. Um, next, just a couple things on training. Um, we are sending a couple teachers, along with myself, to the Midwest Behavior Conference um, on Leadership and Behavior Disorders in Kansas City. That's coming up at the end of the month, February 29th to March 2nd. Um, it addresses issues um, of behavioral, um, emotional behavioral disorders and autism spectrum disorders in particular. Um, our um, EBD teacher, veteran, and, uh, and leader up there, Chuck Wellman in EBD, is really excited about uh, some of the engaging activities and sessions in math instruction. Um, there are some great um, sessions on evidence-based tiered behavior supports um, that I'll be attending. And then uh, Jen Helbig is sort of our in-house autism consultant, along with Jean Edwards, who, who does a lot of that work as well. Um, she's going to be attending a lot of these sessions on autism and autism spectrum disorders, particularly around problematic behaviors. Um, with that, then also uh, that same week, um, we will have a couple of our staff, Natalie Jackson, SLP, and Jean Edwards attending uh, the SLP conference, um, the state conference, and it's sponsored by CESA 5. That's in Wisconsin Dells. Um, there will be a um, speaker, um, an expert in sensory integration, <coughs> um, as well as collaborative goal setting work and working with students with challenging behaviors, um, and also considering dismissal of speech language services. Uh, because we do sometimes have those, um, what are really, you know, both database discussions, but also ethical discussions when we're talking about whether a student qualifies um, for a disability or continues to qualify for a disability, and, and we may be on the verge of dismissal. Those are pretty complex things um, and conversations, and, and even Ms. Edwards, I know, as, as mentioned, she's excited to, to hear some more about that because we've had a few of those this year. Is Chuck Wellman, is he attending the Midwest Behavior Conference with you? Yeah, he is. Okay. Anything else? All right. Now we'll uh, go on then to our information items. Okay. Referendum. There are your grounds. So a referendum update. Uh, we did a tour of grounds. Keith and George and I uh, about two weeks ago, and we also have a uh, item that is financial related. So let's talk about the physical nuts and bolts tour first. We spent uh, all of our time at the high school. They literally had just poured the concrete in the elementary school addition that day, so it was not walkable, if you will. Uh, it is now, and they are set and primed to put up walls, so you will see your physical six classrooms there and have a sort of a bearing in regards to what the proximity will look like. It's awful exciting. Um, I would say my favorite features are when you look up, when you see that wood, uh, I think it's going to be really, really nice. Uh, remember the safety and security pieces of that. And we will now have a uh, entrance that is a sole entrance for all parents when they drop off and pick up and you're moving to your right when you're doing clubhouse and to the left when you're doing elementary school. And we have safe and secure doors there that and buzz in at doors that didn't exist and hasn't existed since 1967 when the elementary school was first put up. So we are moving into 2024 in that regard. At the high school, as Josh already mentioned, we are 
in the middle of the most recent phase, which will be, I guess, ending approximately April 1, if you will. And then we'll move into the next phase, and then we move into some really big stuff at the high school, math, science, and commons, which have sort of just been sitting on the horizon for the long, longest time. Now we're on the near horizon, as in it's not far off. I'm not sure if Paula or Josh or Keith, you wanted to chime in with anything on those items. Nothing to chime in, but can ask, answer any questions if you have anything. Did you help clean the egg area? I help clean every area, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> but he said egg. That, I'm yeah, assuming he means there's a lot going on down there. There's a lot going on down there. That, no, that was a big undertaking. <laughs> <laughs> We've got some science guys right now that have accumulated 25 plus years yes, worth of stuff, and I remind them every single day it's going to be here sooner than you think. So, yep. purge. Yes. I've been saying it all yes, along. Right. Purge. Yes. Now That's is the time. Word. Derek is yes. still resisting the I'm purge. Sure he is. <laughs> yes. So, the other portion of referendum slash building and grounds, John's going to help walk us through, which is the financial piece. You'll see this item titled as Master Budget, and he can walk through for you what you see there. Go ahead, John. So this is a Krauss Anderson prepared document, actually, I'm sorry, series of documents. Um, and it's, again, very high level. Um, there's just a, a couple of points that I just want to point out really briefly. So the, uh, the owner soft cost portion that's on like the lower two thirds of the page, those are the few items that we have responsibility for. Um, but those are also paid through the referendum proceeds. I just, I know that there's some kind of confusion there. Um, but as far as uh, everything else is concerned, it just reads like a typical master budget, top down, left, right. Um, when we start talking about the contingency, um, that's when we start talking about that number that's on the very bottom highlighted in green, the total over under budget. And if you go all the way to the right, that's where that number sits as of today. If you go to the second page uh, of this, that is the actual, um, the CO list or the contingency item list. Um, so this is where we take those wish list items, if you will. Do you want to switch to this second one? Yep. So this is where you, you start rolling in some of the more or less wish list items. Um, the tier two, tier three um, type problem children that we wanted to hopefully squeeze in. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask. This is a new one to us. And again, this is a Krauss Anderson prepared document that we'll start showing monthly until the end of the project. Thank you. I just really want to thank George Bigsworth. Mm -hmm. um, when you go around with him, he's, he's the man with his hands in everything, everything. And he's watching and working with Krauss Anderson and, and the staff and, and that and trying to make, he's, he's kind of like the head coordinator and watchdogging for the taxpayers and, and, and for the staff as to what are the needs that we need. And, how he can make things work. So uh, kudos to him. When I would I was, say the, oh, sorry, go ahead. When I was getting my license uh, for superintendency, I had to do hours in a district that were not was not your own. So I did hours with Nick Owlatt down in Hudson. And uh, they were in the middle of their referendum, was a $100 million referendum, and they were upgrading their high school. And I said to George in passing with him, George, how would you like to be involved in a $100 million upgrade project? And George, all he said was, I would love it. He wasn't lying. Yeah. He loves it. He yeah, most of the owner and soft cost budget things that are on the lower two thirds, that's all what George is handling on his own. Yeah. And, and again, just by him doing it is saving us a, probably a million dollars. Uh, in the end, you're probably right yeah. because there is no fee for George to handle it. He's yeah. in house. So absolutely. Our next building and grounds meeting is on Wednesday, the 13th of March. So we'll see the latest and greatest at that point. We might even see walls at the elementary school. I think we probably will. Um, the weather has been delightful for a referendum, but uh, we take no responsibility for that other than to say thanks. <laughs> it's been oh, nice. Oh, yeah, I mean, just ground thawing and 
encampment and buildings that I mean that, <coughs> things that you can excavate in February typically are not what you can do right this February yeah yeah good it's moving along good Thank it you. is uh, next we will have the Wasba State so I was now I I would I appreciate uh, being selected as delegate because I had a lot of fun down in Milwaukee uh, learned a lot of stuff uh, I went down with George and to piggyback on what you guys said we had a we had a lot of hours of conversation and what I got from George was he loves his job he loves the people he loves making sure everybody's got a safe warm environment to work in and then every morning he'd get up and tell me about how many alarms he shut off at two o'clock in the morning <laughs> <laughs> yeah and so like it doesn't stop working but anyway I, I appreciate him and uh, and everybody working in those areas but uh, good time down there learned a lot I sat in on a three-hour school finance meeting and so I appreciate you too because I don't want to do that that's <laughs> being a business owner is one thing trying to figure out what you guys do is a whole nother planet so thank you for that um, we walked around the convention I didn't I didn't get a personal opportunity to visit with a lot of folks just because I was in and out of sessions and uh, when we weren't in sessions we were grabbing lunch so we could get back to another session so um, but the other folks got to walk around the only thing that uh, I brought back to the board is I got a delegate packet back probably December and I didn't look at it because I'm green and I figured it was just information about the event coming up and so I looked at it after our last board meeting and recognized that it was a bunch of resolutions that was that get sent out to the delegates and when I got down to Milwaukee and we sat in on the delegate session, there were uh, folks down there that would stand up and say, my school board talked about these things and would like to make this suggestion or would like to make this change or what have you. And that's something that we never did. And my understanding is that it hasn't been done in years if it was done ever. There were points of advocacy um, in my time as a high school principal, but not a point of emphasis that was very often held by a board. Okay. Most of those were in regards to state finance. Not much has changed on that. Yeah, so um, next year, I would like for that to be something that the board looks at those resolutions, and then we, we discuss before we go down there, and one of us um, represents our district. Um, they're pretty straightforward, and again, it's nothing that's law. This is something that, that is a, a WASB resolution book, and then, then WASB is using the recommendation of all those combined boards, to talk to their lobbyists on how they want to talk to our state legislature about issues. So, but I think it's important that we, we walk through it. Most of the stuff that we voted on and discussed was just no brainer stuff. Um, but there are a few things that probably wouldn't hurt for us to just discuss and then have that delegate go down with the representation of the entire board. So with that, yeah. it, was, it was great and I appreciate it. Good, always learning. Thanks for doing that for yeah. us, and thanks for volunteering for next year to go back down and bring <laughs> us that information. I did have fun, but it was it was a long it was two weeks on the road. I got back from there and I hopped right on a plane and left. So yeah, yeah, you were kind of crunched there. So. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Mm -hmm. uh, next, we'll talk about our revised curriculum schedule. Jessica, she and I can walk you through this. So as year three in this uh, director of curriculum role, um, vetting resources, working with reps, department reps, trying to get quotes for 10 to 11 years. It's a 10 year um, cycle, so you'd be implementing a new resource on year 11. Um, it was very tough to get quotes really beyond probably year seven. So as an administrative team, we just had conversation about, is there a way that we can shorten the length of that cycle? Another thing that we considered is how much curriculum changes in 10 years. So I can tell you a big movement is science of reading. That's something that has really um, found some footing, really is pushing a lot of what we're doing in instructing kids how to read. Act 20 is a part of that. So that was a big part of the conversation is can we relook at as we're adopting new resources just to make sure that we're getting new materials in kids' hands and, and we're teaching um, new from new resources. Um, and so we had a lot of conversation on what could that look like. And so along with Mr. Durfler, it was proposed to have a new seven-year rotation. On the bottom of this document, 
Becky added some wonderful notes as usual. Um, the way that we got to that was um, consolidating a, a K-12 science, K-12 social studies, and then K-12 applied arts versus those were standalones on their own. Um, what you can see is the year that they're listed um, is the year the new curriculum will be implemented. So research and then proposals for each subject area happen the year before. So for example, right now we're talking about K-8 science. Um, however, that would fall into next year's rotation because we purchased them after July 1st. So it's kind of a hard timeline that you take a year to vet your resources. I know when we did the ELA resource, that was a big one. We actually vetted that one for about two years. We visited schools and really took our time. So having a year to be able to vet the resource is very important to us. Um, but this really provides our educators with the latest knowledge and tools to be able to um, instruct our <coughs> students. Did I miss anything? I don't think so. It's, it's completely impossible to combine math and English language arts. We didn't even think to. Those are 1A and 1 and 1A of curriculum orders. They're just monsters. So they were held in separate years. Just K-5 ELA is a monster all by itself. So that's why those haven't been combined. I think we've talked about this in the past when we were looking at <coughs> um, trying to con like contracts for especially the digital subscriptions and things that we were running into this issue Companies before. will not do it. Seven years is about as far as you're going to go. Eleven, they won't even talk to you about that. My first year when I vetted a company, I said, can I quit? A 10-year a, a quote, and they said, well, we really hope to be in business in 10 years. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Good response. That's fair. <laughs> If you go back to the original 11 year, that's we were buying hardcore textbooks that were this thick, right? And we were trying to get 10, 11 years out of them. And even then, the books were pretty bad shape after 11 years. Can you oh. imagine? So, yeah. Yes. It, now you, you really can't get the hardcover to that level anymore. It's all digital mostly. Yeah. Which yeah. is, you know, as you said, Char, they're updating it as it comes out. Even our ELA, they added some new um, structured literacy pieces, and those were, you know, as, when they noticed that they needed to add a science of reading alignment piece, they added that in, that becomes ours. So what's great about the digital tools is as they are updating it, we get those updates. We're not having to repurchase textbooks 11 years later. We're getting them as they roll out. If I remember right, didn't we have to, like, beg, borrow, and steal here a couple of years ago to extend uh, that for that 11th year to, yeah. if, like the company didn't even want to that. Yeah. Mrs. Holt, this makes more sense. Who does the purchase ordering after this was thrilled to hear seven years. <laughs> she said, you just made my job a lot easier to work with companies on trying to get seven year quotes. Yeah, this just makes more sense. So nope. Jessica's in perpetual mode of what's on deck. So we've already started talking about 4K through 12 social studies. We've had almost two months of conversation on that already. So that's what's on deck. So this isn't an action item, simply updating you as to what our new processes will be. And this works okay with our budget, we've how we had, the budget set up then? Yep, we've had that conversation already. Where we're going to have to keep our eye on is what math separated into two years looks like and what English looks like. But we've got a little bit of time. We're pretty confident social studies will fit like science fit. But we'll keep our eyes on the prize with math because that one can get out of hand quick. But English language arts can really get out of hand quick because mm -hmm. that is... The, that's the godfather of all yes. curriculum orders, but yes, it will fit. As it should be, though. It's, it's a big deal. Thanks. <coughs> all right. Do you want to go with Debbie? Yes, but let's do the state superintendent yeah, quick, and then we'll, then we'll move Debbie up in the rotation. All right. Okay. So a state superintendent visit, that's Dr. Jill Underly. She is uh, the state superintendent of instruction. She'll be here on Thursday. Uh, this is in recognition. We were selected for our accolades and accomplishments in the area of CTE at the high school. Uh, CTE, for those who don't live in the world of acronyms that us educators do. So we're starting on Thursday. This will give you the acronyms. Uh, the, one of the branches of CTE is construction or tech ed. We're going to start our tour at the most recent house build on Hillcrest. We've built now two and I guess a half houses there. We haven't finished it yet. After we're done with that first uh, part of the tour, then we'll talk about school farm, which is your second part of CTE, ag. 
And then after that, we move over to the high school, and we're going to talk about family and consumer ed and tour our classroom there and talk about what we uh, do as a family and consumer ed department. And lastly, we stop in business ed where we talk about dual credit opportunities and transcripted credit opportunities. We've got kids that are leaving high school with a whole lot of credits in the bank that they took while they were high school kids. And uh, we've been doing that for quite some time, and the state's recognizing that. So state superintendent on Thursday for anyone that wants to join starts at 9 a.m. at our house build there on Hillcrest. You won't miss us. Josh, anything you wanted to say? Nope. I mean, originally the hope was maybe to possibly get outside and kind of showcase the farm a little bit, but I got a feeling by Thursday it's going to be pretty sloppy out there. So You can Bring see it from the back door, yep, though, right? That, that's the plan, to point the, <laughs> the Christmas tree farm out in the... Some of the yeah, we'll we'll give her a bird's eye view of things. And are you guys are, are you gonna have some like the our we always see the aerial overview um, maps when we have our committee meetings and when we talk about this. We, will you have some of those? We're leaving this to the CTE teachers to come up with their own presentation. So would you tell Derek to maybe have an aerial? <laughs> <laughs> what are you saying? We'll see what they come up with. Uh, it was I think that's why she's asking me. I, I, I read between the lines. <laughs> it was a point of emphasis and then some from the DPI. They wanted to hear from the kids and not from the adults. So the kids are really doing the tour, which is yeah. what we're all about here anyway. We've got our kids very well versed in what they're doing. I'm, I'm going to be thrilled to see the difference in, in the kids. You know, like I'm thinking FFA egg kids versus construction built, right? Our built different kids versus like our yeah. FFA kids that are all out there like, I want to talk at every cost. Like they, they could go on for two hours and our CT kids were like, yep, built that, built yep. that. <laughs> Everything <Same>. straight. <laughs> well, we'll see what they have to say on Thursday. I'm so excited for this presentation. Yes. So excited. Yes. It'll be great. Okay. We're going to go out of order on the agenda yep. and uh, Debbie's going to be here from Baird and she's going to help us through this and John will be her assistant. Yeah, I'll just give you a little bit of a, a warm up here, Debbie. So what we have in front of us tonight is really two different components. So um, in the fun world of municipal loans, um, we've got two different th resolutions that are in front of you. One is for the NAN or the note anticipation note, which is the short term borrow that leads to the long term borrow, if that makes sense. <coughs> If that's a fair way, go ahead. Yeah, and uh, Debbie can kind of talk a little bit more into details with that. Um, and then the second thing we're just going to glance over really quick is the general obligation refunding bond, which is the long term. Excellent. Thank you. So good evening. Feels like a long time since I saw you in June. A lot has happened between then and now. And uh, today is a good day as we share this information with you. So next, next slide, please. Oops. There we go. So tonight you're being asked, we'll, we'll start with the first part, the note anticipation note, as John mentioned. So this is a short-term financing. With approval tonight, this deposits the money in the bank account. So as invoices start coming in, you can use these funds to pay. We were using a planning interest rate of 5.25%, and the all-in cost is 4.19%. So a full percentage point better than what we're using. Because this is just a short-term financing and it's only over a few months, the savings is, uh, generates $9,000, which isn't you know, 500000 or a million, but every little bit helps. Yeah. And remember that because this, this is coming from the operational budget, this isn't a levy impact, it's a budget impact. So it results in $9,000 less needing to come out of your operational budget in order to pay. So great news. Um, if approved tonight, the dollars will be deposited on March 6th and available for you. The next slide shows how this fits in your long-term picture of it. So our, our $5 million, that note anticipation note, is the first part. We are already working on the second part. We are preparing for your rating call before this meeting earlier today. Uh, the reason we do the short term is it allows us to get the funds so that they're available. And then it gives us time to, to work on the rating and the formal official statement and such so we can lock in the long term. So we were using 5.25% on the long term as well. And the second part of this is the parameters resolution. We did include that as the maximum because that is what we, are, we have been working toward. But we have tightened up this estimate for your visual tonight. Um, this 4.46 for the second phase 
is still about 35 basis points conservative. And so we still have a little cushion in there. Um, but again, we can go up to that full, the 5.25% in case the market shifts in the next month or so. We don't anticipate it, it, it will. But even if we were to come in at the 4.46, that's about $20,000 a year that you would save in the budget compared to the estimates that we've been working on. So every interest percent we can save and keep whittling away on just helps that operational budget. Again, not levy impact, budget impact. Okay. So good news tonight, we, we try to estimate conservatively. Um, it's always a better conversation to come back and say it's better. Um, but hopefully it, um, it's a good rate today, and hopefully the market stays so we can lock in just as good, if not better, in another month. Any questions for me? <coughs> well done. Yeah. Hmm? Thank you. Yeah. Team Always effort. Sean and John effort. contributed as well, and yeah. the rest of the team. But Always good news to see yeah. that lower interest rate. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so more to follow. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. The more to follow on the horizon, you already know about the March 27th meeting in regards to athletics design. So where we're at in the process right now, I think you all know this, but for the public, we're in design phase. LHB is nearly done with the design. First or second week of March, we'll have a design finish that can be given to Krauss Anderson to, the, to, to then bid out the work. Uh, once they bid off the work, they enter into contract, which gives you exact numbers, because then you know how much uh, an outfit will do this, this, and this for. Um, once that contracted work is all bid out and locked in, that'll be a right around the time, uh, the beginning of that process will be right around the time when we're meeting on the 27th to see that final design. So the month of April will be all that bidding and contracting. And then at the first part of May is when we start, it'll be excavation, everything from the soccer field up to the baseball field will be excavated basically May 1. And then May 13th is when the baseball field will go. And then you'll start working on that uh, football track soccer complex. And the only drawback to May 13th is we'll only lose two home games. And Jeff's already got a plan for those two games. So we don't lose anything but two games, which is really nice to know. And then after that, our first ball game on that field is August 23rd and then our second ball game is a soccer match and that's on August 27th so it's a very exciting time there's been a lot of waiting like hurry up and then wait and we've been waiting it's it's very very real and here obviously is very very real tonight so it's a ex very exciting time to be in Amory Warrior Athletics in the community of Amory so not sure if you have any questions for me. This is an action item for these resolutions, and I'll let you do your thing on that. It is actually two separate Ones, resolutions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll need a motion for the resolution authorizing the issuance and awarding the sale of five $5 million dollar note anticipation note. So moved. Char and second. Second. Dale. All those in favor, say aye. I'd like some discussion. Okay. So I know we're speaking about our sports, and sports is a huge deal in in Amory. And uh, I mean we're at we're already past the point I feel like where there's really no turning back. And uh, we're willing to spend uh, five million dollars right now to get this. We're looking at spending another million dollar movement with referendum funds. Correct, John? Yeah, more or less. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, and possibly even more if we're looking at having 1.9. And uh, it, makes, it brings me to the thought process of, okay, well, are we spending all this money appropriately? And uh, I happened to attend a uh, school safety part of a Chiefs of Police conference and I remember after, was it Uvalde or was it Parkland? Probably Uvalde. That's Uvalde. the last one. Okay. Last major. We had a bunch of, did we have some school safety meetings? Yes, we did. Yeah. Okay. And I think all of us here would do anything for our kids to not make, put them in that same position. And I want all of us to realize that we're going to vote for sports tonight 
before a police officer in our schools. Um, and I'm not saying that, and again, I, we went over the failures that this, that law enforcement had at these conferences, but we also talked about the failures of the community, of our schools, um, the before, during, and after failures. And I want all you again to know that I really, I mean, we all care, right? I know I'm talking apples to steak here, but if we're going to spend, you know, who knows, up, up, upwards of over $6 million in sports, when are we truly <coughs> going to start looking into our children's safety at school? I think that uh, you're suggesting that they're not, and that's very inappropriate. Tell me how I'm not. How am I, again, the way, how, you, the way you worded that. Okay, so if I would rather, again, I would rather, I care about your kids. I care about your kids, and I care about our kids, and I care about your kids, and your kids, and your kids, and yours. And if there was something that we could do financially to better the safety of our children, we should do it. I have, I have a couple questions about that. Um, first of all, I, logistically here, we've already entered into and accepted a resolution to borrow the $5 million. That's already been a done deal. I don't think we can back out of that at this point. I mean, we haven't put the money in the bank. That's obviously what we're doing Thank here. You. But... Is I think that, you're. I think you're out an exorbitant amount of money if you do not vote for these resolutions based on the design fees alone. Is that what you're suggesting that we? No, I'm. I'm telling you that I'm. That I think I'm in the wrong. Think, knowing that I'm going to vote yes, but that I think we should spend our money um, towards things I which I care about more. Okay, and so okay, so that being said, then we'll move past that. Then my second question is: so after you brought up the meetings that we had after Uvalde. So we had two school safety and security meetings after Uvalde. Um, I think you attended the first one. You did not attend the second one. Um, but we actually kind of talked about having a school resource officer, I think, at the first one. And I, I think that you had actually, we talked about doing those kind of things. And we talked about bringing a school resource officer back. And you um, were kind of on the fence of, should we have one or shouldn't we have one? And who is that going to be? And how do we manage that with the Emory Police Department? And it, if we're going to have one, it has to be somebody that can connect with the kids, the logistics, all of those things. And then we wanted to kind of talk more about that at the second meeting. Um, and, and you weren't there to, to do that. And we haven't had another meeting since then. We so have. We actually have. Not with the board. Not with the board. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That, that's what I meant, we're, not with the board. We're kind of wandering away from open meeting rules because school, I know we're, we're kind of in that gray area, though, uh, talking about what we want to do as far as safety for our kids versus the resolutions at hand. I'm actually trying to talk about the financing aspect of this. Yeah, so I guess okay. that, and that's where I was going to go with that as well. So the financing of, let's say, I guess all of those suggestions that you're talking about with safety, but we have implemented some of that with our referendum dollars that was passed uh, by the community. So I think that we should have had maybe those conversations before we've gotten this far along into just putting the $5 million into our bank account. Those conversations probably should have come before we voted to do that. And, and I don't I don't think that we did that sufficiently then, if that's where you're going with, with this. No, in re again, in regards to the financing of this phenomenal improvement to our school district, I would like us to, again, think about just differently in regards to what we can spend our money on. And I, I guess at that's point well taken, but I think we should have had those conversations back last spring when we started this. Like that should have been something that the board should have said, 
we don't want to spend $5 million on, a, on athletics. Let's shift our focus and think of how we're going to spend $5 million on school security. I think we're almost a year past that at this point. Not that you can't have it in the future. Right. right. More conversations yeah. about that yeah. in the future, right. But this, you know, this $5 million, that's what, what we've budgeted for, what we've taken this loan out for is one purpose, and it was to upgrade our sports facilities. And now to kind of say this tonight, in Key's point, not only does it violate some open meeting situations, but also... Because we've never done that. So let's just get down to it. I'm sorry for bringing it up. I just want the community to know this is what I think. Would you this like, is what I think about. And we can do this. Sorry. Would you like um, the school safety piece to be an agenda item in March? Well, I, I, I think it, yeah, I, th I think if there's anything we can do to better the safety of our schools and our children, I'm, we should have it tomorrow. Well, we are, I, I know we're venturing off the town. Yeah, right? we're getting there. Um, <laughs> but in March, what you'll hear are two things. We have a tour of all of our buildings on Friday with the Emory Police Department led by uh, their new chief. We're meeting with each of the buildings for 45 minutes apiece. And then on April 15th, we've devoted the first half of that in-service day to nothing but safety and security and our ability to communicate with police, fire, between buildings, district office, two buildings. That's happening on April 15th. But we'll talk more about that in March. So those things are happening. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. All right. All right. And the motion is made and second for the first resolution. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Nothing's done. The second resolution, I'll look for a motion, re resolution authorizing the issuance and sale of a not to exceed $5 million general obligation refunding bonds. Do I have a motion? I'll make that motion. Dale? I'll second it. Joe? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? There we go. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Next, we'll go to our first reading of changes to staff handbook documents. Okay, uh, items that you'll see here on the screen, there are four items, two certified staff and two support staff. Uh, these are the byproduct of uh, a lot of meetings. Uh, we have an advisory committee that meets with myself. There are 15, 20, I would say, somewhere around there, cross-section of buildings uh, in, in job descriptions. Uh, we meet five, six, maybe even seven times a year. Uh, we did a listening session uh, some 10 days ago. Dale and Shar were the point people <coughs> for that. A uh, listening session was just that, for Dale and Shar to hear from certified staff and from support staff. Uh, we had about a dozen people or so from the certified staff and three or four from the support staff to share their thoughts. Uh, we had some, some reds and some blues. Now we've come to a this document where you'll see, just see blue changes. Uh, nothing is being determined here. A formal final vote here this evening. This is a first uh, reading, so there's no action. This is but an informational. And then uh, in March, if you're inclined, then you would take action. So the first item you see is the certified staff handbook. There's not much here to see. This first item is name changes. Out with the old and with the new. Sorry, that's really what it is. <laughs> Uh, there's, I believe, only one or two more spots where you'll see blue. Here is a breach of contract language. Breach of contract is you leave in the middle of your contract, so you leave in the middle of October. Uh, your contract starts July 1, finishes June 30. And what this says is if um, you do leave, there is a penalty to you. Uh, if you leave, if you sign a contract, for instance, in May, and you leave prior to July, it's a 3% of your total contract. So if your wage was 50000 3% of 50000 is $1,500 penalty. If you leave after August 1st, say October, it's a 5% penalty, which would be a $2,500 penalty. And that has happened over the years here a couple of times this past year. And then in the event of the breach of contract, the employee's current year paid time off days will be prorated for the number of months worked. If the employee has used more PTO, then they are entitled to, per the proration, the employee's per diem rate of pay for each extra day used will be deducted from their pay. So those couple of sentences are entirely new, and they are an offshoot of folks living in the middle of the year and 
breaching the contract. And just jump in whenever you have questions. Don't have to wait till the end. But this document doesn't have many changes whatsoever. If we go on a little further, there is, I might even be wrong, there might even be no more changes in oh, this one. There's one more. Please one more. At the top there. Okay. Uh, this is for personal vehicles and district vehicles. This is in working with our insurance provider. Uh, it says uh, that we have stricken the language each school year to every other school year. Approved drivers must immediately notify the district office office of changes to their driving record, including actions, accidents, or violations. So we want to make sure whoever's being a volunteer driver is in good standing. I have a question about yes. that. We'll I don't know if there's some. He's probably the one that can answer it. Maybe but. that's okay. Um, there is. I don't know if this is confusion or maybe I don't. I don't understand this. But if we have volunteer drivers who drive uh, students to a a function, um, but they have to use a school vehicle, do they have to have their own? In I mean, generally everybody by state law has to have their insurance their own insurance anyway. Whose insurance covers if there's an accident? Please help me. Yeah, so our insurance company, EMC, is our primary. Tricor EMC is our primary. Their preference is that no student is ever driven for official, if for official reasons by anyone other than a paid staff member. That's, that's what their preference would be is school vehicle, paid staff member, coaches, advisors, people who have some sort of letter of appointment or some sort of temporary contract fall under that, that category as well in a school vehicle. That is their preference unequivocally. They do understand that exceptions need to be made um, to that rule for smaller districts. Um, the uh, prime example would be uh, Danielle Erdrich uh, is the forensics uh, uh, advisor. Um, she needed a second in command. Her husband, I forget his name, but uh, he's Brian, uh, has subbed for us in the past. Uh, he is known to the district. So, and he is an advisor, although he's unpaid. So does he qualify under that or not? That's where there's a little bit of a gray area. What we're trying to avoid with this policy verbiage change is last minute having a spouse or a significant other or a cousin who's not doing anything for the weekend, uh, grabbing, a, grabbing their own vehicle, grabbing another school vehicle, whatever the case may be, and transporting students um, is ultimately what it is. So the, the, where we go with it is, is a little bit up to us. Um, technically speaking, the insurance is on the person, not the vehicle, right? So it's, it would be the primary insured would be the person who's driving the vehicle who is obtaining that that but the reality is that emc is going to get hit for it either way does that make sense yeah i just there's been some i guess discussion and um the, it's caused some volunteer drivers um that we have to other events to be like i'm not going to do this if it's going if i'm going to be on the hook for if and something happens, a deer runs in front of me or a, another car is at fault or whatever, I'm going to be on the hook. So it's my insurance company. I don't want to, I don't want to drive then. So that presents a problem. And we do have people in the district um, who have driven to a lot of events for many years that have, have always driven, whether it be a school vehicle or a private vehicle. Now I understand the, the difference that we have to use a school vehicle. If a school vehicle isn't available, then what happens? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a great question. And I think if you were to ask the insurance company, they would say, then you don't go. And I, I think they're taking this harsh stance because we do have in the state of Wisconsin, we've had we have had several incidents involving fatalities of volunteer drivers driving students. And so I think there is a little bit of precedent there that they're trying to work against. Um, you know, my, my personal would be, I think that we have a robust enough list in the district office now of approved uh, volunteers, not necessarily, you know, paid, um, whether it's a coach or an advisor uh, or anything like that. I think we do have a robust enough list where if you needed to have 
an additional person to transport students, you would be able to grab that list and ask one of them to, to assist. Um, does that make sense? I, I think that's part of the reason why we've been cataloging and doing all that for since September of this year is to really kind of refer people to other areas. Um, yeah. Okay. Are there any other changes in this one? I can't remember. Just the date. Yeah. And the date at the end. Yeah. Are, are, are these changes, do you run these handbooks past your legal? Uh, the, all of these handbooks have been seen by legal multiple times, including, and this is an entirely new update, our grievance policy, which I was asked to get revised. That is officially revised, and that's going to be on the agenda for May and June. So we can look at that at that time, because that's a handbook item. And, and that's an employment lawyer? Yes. Okay. That's what Steve Well does by trade. And then the, the changes to the breach of contract, how do those compare to other districts in the area? I don't know what other districts are doing. I unfortunately do know that what many districts are doing is when someone breaches contract with their previous employer and shows up at the doorstep of District A, B, C, whatever it is, they're paying the breach of contract from the previous district. That's been asked of us, and my answer has consistently been no. I just don't want to get into that game. I don't want someone to break contract elsewhere. I don't want to do that to them. Uh, but that is beginning to happen. But I don't know what their percentages are. Some probably have no percentage at all. It turns out to be teacher poaching, basically. Right, yeah, you want to avoid that. that yeah. But that occurs in every other system right Oh, yeah, now. absolutely. Yeah. That's and, not new. I mean, we're doing it in criminal justice. It's not new. So, I mean, again, if there's an opportunity to get a great teacher, that's what we have to do at times. And, again, with this recruitment and... Uh, you know retention issues that are everywhere this is this is how we have to get good people by stealing and retain good people yeah, in criminal justice you're stealing them. absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well we haven't done that yet here i get it uh, That's good. I, I, I would like to it. i would like to hold the line on not having to do that thus far we haven't but who knows what the future holds okay the second item is the Certified Staff Compensation and Benefits Guide. Again, the changes are in blue. If you'll note here, all the way down from top to bottom, from A1 to I8, you'll see a new number, a blue number. Um, if you're playing along and wanting to know the total price take of all those changes, I can't give you an exact one because I don't know who's going to be here next year. But if everyone that's here now is here next year, the price take is $285,000. But I am here to tell you, in less than an hour, you're going to see two people that are already not here because they're going to be retiring, one of which is a certified staff person. That's an I-8. So that number is going to change automatically. So that would be the price tag if you're following along on that first page. And again, if there's any comments or suggestions, Dale and Shar, you sat there with us on that <coughs> evening. Um, if you want to bring something up, please do. The only question I have is because yes. I don't have experience in this particular area, right? I'm, I'm in a... A business realm not mm -hmm. in a public realm um, are there changes to compensation revolving around cola cost of living or is it strictly it, it just has, on the year adjustment it hasn't been noted as specifically as cost of living but that's been part of the conversation what it's in essence been is to, to remain competitive you aren't going to pay your folks you aren't going to keep your folks and you're not going to be able to recruit any new folks that's just reality we have been historically quite low in the A's and the B's uh, we had a lot of conversation about the D's, the E's, and the F's. That's where we focused our energies in recent years, and less so on the I's. But in this case, everybody moves forward by the same percentage. And if you're looking for what that percentage is, the grand total growth would be 3.75%. It's 1.75% as natural growth. Uh, E3's become F1's, F3's, or F, uh, A3's become B1's. And then there's a 2% on top of that. That's how you get the 3.75. So it's just been trying to remain competitive. And also working within the budget, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. My first conversation after generating this proposal was with John and Twyla. I mean, that's the very first stop. Because if it's not affordable, why well, proceed forward? So can I ask a question? It's kind of off topic, but it does revolve around this. When I was down at the state convention, 
and again, green, right? Only uh, not even a year into it yet, and learning about school finance. And they talked about the the financing budget per pupil coming from a number that was generated in 1993. That is accurate. And adding a couple of hundred dollars here and there to that 1993 number. The, the budget model in the state is completely archaic. Yeah. Right, and, and through that process, I, I learned that some districts that got really lucky in 1993 make piles of cash per pupil. Well, I shouldn't say make, but have a piles of cash available per pupil. And my question is, because it does revolve around this years and years down the road, are you aware of any organization or any group that's lobbying to try to adjust that 1993 number more drastically than? Well, the first thing they're trying to do is overrule Act 10. So that's happening right now. So they're trying to overrule Act 10, which was Scott Walker. Do I think they're trying to fix that number? I think they absolutely are, which is why you saw the low uh, revenue ceiling increase to 11,000. Um, that before was 10,000, and the vast majority of the school districts, 80% who are in rural areas, fell below that. So everyone, there, it was, it was the, it's talked about widely as were you good, bad, or meh when 93 was here and we were meh. We weren't good, we weren't bad, which puts us into a position where we're at today where we're okay, but obviously we could be better. Um, and so I think the, the first step is WASBO, WASDA, WASPI, all those organizations really heavily kicked up and started doing a lot around the Joint Committee on Finance before last biennial budget, which was this time last year. Um, and that's when we started discussing the per pupil increase. What we ended up with is abysmal compared to what was uh, forecasted based off of the state budget surplus. So hopefully if we have another year or two of budget surplus at the state level, they'll finally start to listen to what the DPI is recommending. The follow-up to that is, is there more that we could be doing? More as a board, more as a group of teachers, more as a community to get in front of our legislature? I think it's you contacting them or passing resolutions as a board if you feel inclined to do so, stating X, Y, and Z needs to occur. That's what's happening in districts across the state. Uh, the Wisconsin Association of School Boards, the Wisconsin Association of School District Administrators, uh, Wisconsin Association of School Business of Officials, all three of them have been after the legislature for two decades and have only met with lukewarm success. Who they need to hear from is regular folks that are not on the board, but they need to hear from you as well. Well, and that's, that's my question. Can, can we do something to give our community the tools they need to get the right message we're in right pretty people. we're in pretty good shape and as a direct result of the referendum from 2017 is the reason we're in good shape because there's that that continual override some districts are not in that position to be able to do that but what they continue to tell us is tell them your story and the story is that we can't do this this and this because we don't have the money to do so we're not presently in that position we were in that position in Dale's you know the latter year of Dale's career as a yeah. Uh, school board member back throughout the early 2000s. Very, years. very lean years, years. Cutting $900,000 in the budget. We're thankfully not in that position right now, but some districts are. Then there are districts that uh, some of our neighbors who are under levying by millions of dollars because they have such huge growth in student populations and such, uh, in essence, high revenue limits to be able to generate income to do these things. We're neither of those. We're not at the bottom, we're not at the top. So anyway, I'll let you get back to your thing, but, but for the public, one of the things that I learned down in Milwaukee that was fascinating to me was 80% of the districts in the state of Wisconsin have gone to referendum just for operational purposes. And so if you look at our budget and you say, why is it the way it is, it, well, we're not the only one. No, we're not. And I was just at the CISA uh, 11 superintendents meeting last Friday, and Brandon Robinson, the um, I forget his title, but I think he's the executive director of CISA 11, did a show of hands. Who went to referendum in 2022? Who went 2023? Who's going in 2024? I think every hand in the room went up for one of those three. So every single, and some went we're up in more than one year. So yes, that is 80% is actually not even true in CISA. It's almost 100%. You have no other choice. There's an, it's only one way to raise income. 
anyway, back to it. Yep. On page two, yep. you will see a couple of blue numbers there. Uh, these are for folks that are interested in getting reading licenses. We're always interested in that and special ed license. We're just simply increasing the stipend to do that. That's not a very uh, high number of folks. I'm just here to report that not a lot of people are interested in that work. They're mid-career and they're not doing that. But if someone wants to, we're ready to help them out. So that's change. The in lieu of health insurance, for the longest time, the in lieu of health insurance, if you're a married couple in district, we've got 10 such um, situations in the district between support staff and certified staff of married couples. You are not eligible for the in lieu of benefits. So basically it said is not eligible. There was no number there at all. What we're proposing in this is to benefit our 10 married couples with $2,000 in lieu of. That's a one-time paid expense at the end of the school year in July or no later than July. The reason that we're seeking to do that is a married couple is likely to stay in district together and likely to have kids and raise families in district, which is good for enrollment. And we haven't done that ever. Um, and we believe now is the time to try and benefit those folks to keep them here. Are so we, that's a change. Didn't we, I thought we had done 2,000, but they wanted to increase it to 4,000. There was a proposal to increase to 4,000. We had a meeting last week, the advisory committee, and uh, I'm not here to say <coughs> we agreed to anything, because that's not really the arrangement, but the place we were at last Wednesday when I met with the advisory committee was 2,000. We were at both price points when you guys met with them on February 9th. We talked four, two, I, and zero. People that currently don't take insurance at all get 4,000 today. I if they're not a married couple. Right, right. Yes. So, yeah, I guess the 2,000 came from something it less was, than four. It was zero. It's, it's more not than four. zero, yeah. It's the halfway it's point. It's the halfway point between zero yes. and 4,000, I guess. And again, what does a family health care plan cost? This uh, approximately 20,000. I can tell you, yeah. it's a family package is 2,145.36 per month not cheap to the district or to the employee. So that's a proposed change. Again, these are just proposed changes at this point. If we move on a little further, there's some other items for you. Okay, uh, this is a retirement benefit. We have, not to get into Retirement Plan 101, but we have an old retirement group of approximately 15 people. And we have a newer retirement group, which is everybody else in certified staff, which is approximately 100, 110 people. The uh, proposed language is here to move that price tag of $130 per day NPTO retirement bank to $100, and then the halfway of that moves from 65 to 50. The reason for that change is we are simply out of alignment with what the rest of the CESA is doing in regards to their retirement payouts. The highest payouts are typically in the range of $50, $60, and typically there's a cap of 80, 90, 100 days. We are at 130, and we have unlimited, and uh, that is simply not something the district should responsibly continue to do because we are not even close to where the rest of the CESA is on this topic. So um, if you want me, next month I can bring back what those cost comparisons are. We've talked about it at our listening sessions the last two years. Uh, this language used to say subpay. Remember, two years ago it said subpay. We changed it to 130, giving folks, being very telegraphic, that this is moving to 130, and I am going to recommend that it moves to 100. I said that explicitly to them, so this isn't a surprise. I imagine it's probably met with some disappointment with that retirement group, but it isn't a surprise. So that's the proposal, and I'm not sure if Dale or Char wanted to say anything on that since that conversation was, was lengthy. Yeah, we did talk about that, um, and we are significantly ahead of most of the others that we compare to, right, within c -Cell. We're ahead of everybody significantly, right. everyone in the c -Cell. And not just by, yeah, a significantly. By a lot. Right. Okay. And, yeah. that, that, so that per day, I mean, that, that per, that, her payout is significantly higher. So I'm, I was confused at some, I guess, discussion that was had within, within that, um, the listening session. There were other, when we say that we're ahead of other districts, but were there other 
um, stipends and payouts that were awarded above and beyond the per days that other districts were doing, and then this that really wasn't comparing apples to apples. Some districts, perhaps, but I couldn't. I can't speak to the retirement plans in detail in regards to all districts. But yeah, there are certainly other pieces and other retirement plans. That's likely true. We used to have a ten thousand dollar payout here some ten years ago. That was true, and that went from ten to eight to six to four to two to nothing. So yeah, there could be some remnants of that in other places. But I can say this, in my district administrator group and in the Middle Order Conference, which is eight of us, uh, two different conversations. When I mentioned what ours were, uh, people around me nearly fell out of their chair. They were like, is that for real? I said, yes, that's for real. And they said, how can you do that? That's, I, I, that's what's been happening here for 20, 30 years. They were shocked. So there is another pieces because they would have stepped up and said what their other pieces were. Um, uh, it's just not sustainable. Now remember, WRS is part of this picture as well. WRS is a contribution from the district of 6.9% every check, and they make a contribution of their own. So there is a retirement savings there as well, and everyone has the option to put money into a 403B or a 457. So there are other vehicles by which to retire, not just these dollars. And this is a group that's 15 and shrinking including one tonight's in the old retirement group. There's one less. So each and every year this, this number of people gets smaller and eventually we'll sit here and this whole thing will just be struck out because they're all gone. Was there? Yes, there's the $9,000 a year for retirees each and every year for eight years up to the age of 65. So if you retire at 57, you're gonna get eight years at 9,000. That's not something every district has either. That's something that's been here since as long as I've been here. So they still do get the 9000 yes. per year? Up to 65 because then the government, in essence, picks you up in sure. regards to health insurance as a Medicare person. And Yeah, and that 9000 is basically yes. to help cover. So if you retire at 65, that benefit isn't yours because you're 65. Yeah. Was there any <coughs> further discussion had on this retirement part of it at last week's meeting? Yes, there is disappointment that it's moving, but it wasn't as lengthy a conversation as it was when we met last uh, on February 9th, I think it was. Uh, it was a much briefer conversation. Is it more understandable uh, to those people what's happening here? Uh, I can't speak for them. Uh, I, 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 I think I've been clear as much as I can be clear. Uh, Understanding it and agreeing with it are two different things in my mind. I get well. That's think, what I'm asking, though. I think they folks just have understood it. it. Okay. I think people are disappointed in it. Sure. But for those who, who it affects. Which makes sense. Okay. I mean, certainly. Right. So. I believe the next change is on perhaps the next page. Maybe there it is. Yes, top of the next page. Um, so the new retirement group, they don't. Do the, the system you just heard about, sort of cancel that from your mind. What they get is $2,000 a year, and for every 50 days, they get a $2,000 payment into their HRA. And what this language does is simply clarifies that when you hit that 50 marker, you get 2000 But if you drop down to 49 and then get back to 50 you don't get another 2000 As soon as you hit the 50 you got to get to 100 because if you just drop down and kept going back up, you could probably make bank in a real big hurry. Yeah. So that just makes right. clear that you can't do that. But in addition to that, the last sentence, any days remaining in the employee's PTO bank at time of retirement, short of a 50-day benchmark. So say, for instance, you got 76 days. I get paid for 50, then I got 26 dead days, like they don't do anything for me. The district would agree to pay you $40 a day for those days. 50 into 2,000 is where you get 40. This is, and please note, this is not a recommendation that the advisory committee made to us. This is something we simply came up with in the district office in good faith and working with our staff. Because I always say to them, and they can attest to this, we have to treat them fairly and equitably, but we also have to balance the budget. This, I believe, is a fair and equitable, equitable way to go, because they are truly, right now, 26 days that give you nothing. This would give you something. So that's a uh, recommended change. If we move further along, let's skip PTO, do that last couple of items, then come back to PTO. The um, PDH day trade, well, we can do that with the PTO. 
jury duty. Uh, this was simply a point of clarity. If you get called for jury duty, you can't not go. You gotta go. Um, you don't lose your pay. The only thing we're asking you to do is you get a hefty stipend from the county. I think it's $25. Yeah. <laughs> and you bring that, you can give that to the district. You, you, you don't get the 25, you get your regular jobs pay. Um, I, I'm not discouraging anyone from doing their civic duty and being a part of jury duty, but it isn't part of the paycheck or the lunch at Culver's that's gonna get you to go. So uh, this is simply clarifying that language because some folks were thinking, I went, they, they canceled the trial like ahead of time, so I just went home. But we need you to come back to work. If you do have to serve, just give us your $25 thing, and you're gonna get paid your rate with the deal. So, if your name is called, go. And I think that's it in this section. Maybe, maybe not, yep, okay, then let's go back up. Oh, there's one word change, and that's it. Scheduler is how we refer to it. We have a sub-scheduler, which is Jill Jackson. Can I just go back to, to the retirement one more time yes, before you we can. move along? Yes, you can. Because I have a feeling the PTO is going to get more intense here. So, yes. um, yeah, I guess this was, <clears throat> I don't remember seeing the any days remaining in the employee's PTO bank. They would get the $40 you per day. You did not see that on the 9th. That is true. So, I guess this is, so when I'm looking at this now and then I'm, trying to think about the conversation that we had with the old retirement staff. And it's always kind of been the position since I've been on the board, it's like it's not the district's responsibility to fund your retirement because there's other ways to do that. But to use the words that were used in that meeting last night is that there's a rub between staff, some staff, of we're on the old system, we had to choose, um, and then we have the new people, and they seem to get more than we've got and now we're adding something but we took something away from the people on the old just looking at this tonight then i can see where i could if i was on the old plan and we're like well, we can't afford that but now all of a sudden we're giving people on the new plan something that wasn't even there before like why are we they're getting more and i understand that every every time we hire people as the years go on they're going to have it better than the people that came before them 30 years ago because I mean my grandfather used to cut wood with a cross-cut saw and sell it for 30 cents a cord too but you wouldn't do that anymore so people have it easier but better the benefits are better but I understand the rub between staff um, and how that can create conflicts within a building which is disappointing to me because they're benefits that that everybody's getting benefits I just think it's that whole idea of I'm not getting as much as the next person, and I'm not sure that that's fair. I think the best advice that was given was given by one of our advisory committee members. He literally stood up in the group and said, I think it's time to stop comparing. Just stop, because they're apples and oranges, and they always will be. And I think that's true. Does it, I mean, the other thing, sure, though, is, is if you tell me something, I expect it. You know, I expect I sure hope if you tell me I'm going to get a certain percentage when I retire, I sure hope you keep your word with me. Yes, we absolutely will. In regards to the percentage that's set by the state for WRS, but in okay. regard, you referring to the $130? I am. Okay, here's what I will say about the 130 We track that. If you're an employee that started here in the year 1996, in 1996 to 2004, the number of days you had was multiplied by zero. You got nothing. There wasn't anything at all. In, in 2004, it became 90. And it was $90 until 2016. So what we, we didn't tell staff it was always going to be 90, but it was 90 for 12 years. Then it became 100, then it became 110, then it became 120, then it became 130, then it became sub rate, and now it's 100. So what we have said to staff all along is, you had all these years where it's 90, now it's 100, it's actually coming in ahead of where you had planned for more, half of your career or more. We never said it was gonna stay at subway. we never said it was gonna stay at 130. In fact, I went so far as to be telegraphic and say to them, it's not going to be 130, I'm gonna recommend it goes to 100, and here we are, be recommending going to 100. So there wasn't any promise made, that's not how it went. Yeah, and yeah, we kind of talked about that at the meeting that night, and I, you know, like I, I talked, when I kind of equated this to some staff that night, I think Dale was sitting there, it's like, my only retirement comes from whatever we put in the stock market, and 
Well, we know that these days you can look at your end of the year report and you think that you have X number, but all of a sudden the stock market takes a dive and then you're you're down a hundred grand or two hundred grand or in the next month you can be up. And you're really not you really can't bank on any of that until you, the day you draw it out. And so I guess we talked about that too and uh, that was understood kind of like that. This kind of came from a language change. I think that we probably a couple of years ago <coughs> we changed that language and went away from current subpay and then went to the 130 because the subpay kept getting increased and increased because we had to to get subs. Um, Here would also be my response. If you're in a, 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 a neighboring district down the road, we have a friend of the district office that's retiring out this year with 250 days at $25 a day. $25, not 130 Now it's four, almost five times bigger here for 250 The number of dollars on that is enormous. That's not sustainable. Do we know what an average, roughly, you know, when somebody retires, how many? Runs the gamut. Some I folks mean, retire with little to none, and some folks retire with a huge heap and load of a lot of days. So literally, I mean, some might retire We've had folks retire days, with over might, 300. So 300, you're talking 30,000 That's a chunk of change. That's a, that's I would say it's, I'm, Twyla's not here, she would know best, but I would say an average number is somewhere between 100 and 150 if you've got 25, 30 years in. What do you guys think? Somewhere around there? Something like that. You're getting, ten, you're getting 10 or 12 a year, depending on what year it was. Um, it's not unrealistic to say you'd have 150 days. I mean, some folks get hit with illness. If you have kids, I mean, you're gonna deplete your days in a hurry, that's true. If you're staying home with a child, which most choose to do. So, yes, it can be a lot or it can be very few. We've got folks in district that have been here almost 30 years and have zero days. There's those two. Yeah, I guess I just wanted us to be mindful of why this language looks the way it looks and then with this addition and then I can understand, I can understand then that kind of rub. Um, when we talk about, re, you know, attracting and retaining good staff, so attracting, this looks pretty attractive for people coming in, retaining, um, looks good, you know, there too, but obviously we've retained some of these people on that old retirement system for... 20 years so um, I, I'm also mindful that some of them don't have as many days because they took off for illness or whatever reason they took off and they were paid at their daily rate for the, for those days of not being here too which is more than a hundred yes there, so. there that is a bit of a misnomer and I'm happy that you mentioned that when you're when you're gone you don't not get paid and then not get it in retirement when you're gone you get paid you just don't get paid again later you get paid when you're gone, that time, at that day. I just, I, get, I just wanted us to be mindful as a board that those are some of the things that came out of the listening session that night, and as you're looking through this for the next month, and by the time we vote on it next month, those things that you've had a month to think about those things and, or recommendations that yeah, change. I, mean, I, I, just I would think. just add, you know, I can see somebody's frustration if they run the old plan and it goes from $130 to $100. Um, you know, as frustrated as I am when I open up my statements. But, well, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it is what it is. I and guess. I'm not one to speak on behalf of the advisory community, but I thought I can say confidently in that it's been written in an email and it's been presented here to me and to the people in the listening session, Dale and Char, that the recommendation on that language was to keep it as is. 130 and 65, that's been the recommendation consistently from moment one. So the other uh, round of changes was the PTO on page seven. And PTO, um, the blue again is the changes. If you note in that second paragraph, I'm not one to read it to you, but I'm gonna read a paragraph to you, I guess. The district acknowledges that it must account for days of employee and employee family member sickness and absences due to circumstances out of employee control. Sentence been stricken, reworded. <laughs> Therefore, each certified staff member is granted 12 paid time off days to use each school year. Part-time employees, that paid time off is prorated based on the number of hours that they work in a scheduled week. So you'll see there in blue, those first three um, bullet points, I guess. Our PTO is allowed for illness of employee, illness of employee's family member, and a circumstance out of your control. 
and we've run through a lot of different examples of what would qualify and what wouldn't. You'll see some examples. These are some examples of things that would qualify employee illness, employee of, of a child, a family member, out-of-town wedding, a child's state athletic competition, specialty medical appointments, moving a child into college, child's graduation, uh, closing on a home, surgery, emergency veterinarian appointments, all of these things. Some of them have happened as recently <laughs> as today. <laughs> So, Thanks for acknowledging that the pets are important. The pets are important. <laughs> you you got to go. If your dog wants to eat stuff, you got to go. I got one of those too. So those would all be allowable reasons. I got an, uh, an email, and I'm not, obviously I'm not going to name names. My husband has a surgery. There's anesthesia involved. Someone's got to drive him. It's a blackout day. Can I? It was obviously someone's got to drive him. You don't want the person that's not supposed to drive to drive them. So, yes. I are over. No. Yes. <laughs> so the yeah. the flip side of that is the not allowed vacations when we have extended absences to take vacation. There are opportunities in a certified staff's workload where there are chances to travel. <coughs> Between August and the end of school, August in service and the last day of school, there are 21 days that are in the week, Monday through Friday, where a staff person, certified staff person, could do something, could travel if they wanted 21 days. You counted weekends there's 99 days so there is an opportunity to do that but we're not allowing vacations of prolonged periods of three four and five days it's just not sustainable and further it's not good educationally for kids for their teacher to be gone for a week so that's not sustainable more than two consecutive days exceptions for illness you can't control the illness piece of that uh, we, we would not allow those and extending extending scheduled breaks in the school calendar Probably the most coveted day on the entire 2023-2024 calendar is Friday, March 15th, the Friday before spring break. That's been denied. That's extending a scheduled break. And I can, I can tell you right now, if that one's the green light go, I'm going to have 10 more right behind it. Because everyone wants to get out of town for two reasons. You want to get out of town, and second, airfare is a lot less expensive on Friday than it is on Saturday. But if that's the precedent we're going to set, we're going to have a sub shortage on Friday, March 15th. So examples of PTO which would not be allowed, you're going to a trip to Jamaica, Christmas shopping, a veterinary appointment like you're getting your dog's nails trimmed, you could do that at a different time, Friday off before spring break, Monday and Tuesday of Thanksgiving, February parent-teacher conferences, August in-service, those are just some examples of items that would not be allowed. And within the last week, some of those instances have come up and they've been denied. Vacations and the Friday before spring break, both have been denied following what we presently do and what would now be firmly in place on July 1 if this is what occurred. So I'll let you ask questions or talk or whatever you want to do and I'll sit and listen or answer questions. Well, thanks for making it. these bullet points and you know, um, for people to understand that just because a Friday is a blackout day or whatever, it doesn't mean that you can't do the things that are important for your family time, for um, things that need to have that you need to have happen, health emergencies, scheduled appointments that you can't control. Um, I think that was people were uh, misunderstanding that before. Um, I think the bulleted points here and the, the language cleanup here has been uh, for sure a lot better, a lot more understandable. It's been a work in progress. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. It it appears. I mean, it's given examples to, that people could reference. Um, and did you mention, did you meet last week with staff? Yeah, we met with uh, staff last week, uh, advisory committee last week Wednesday. And mentioned or talked about some of the We talked highlights. about these this particular document, but not yeah. in its finished form. I sent this document that you're seeing here now, I sent this to Jessica Smith, who's the point person for the advisory committee on Friday, and then she shipped it to advisory committee from there. Um, please note that the recommendation from certified staff advisory committee has been to have 12 PTO. For the longest time, this indicated it would be 10. It says 12. I don't want you to miss that point. 12 plus three bereavement days is 15 days. That's exactly what staff have right now. It's not fewer. It's the exact same, 15. So you're not losing days. We're simply adding parameters on PTO use. Okay, so we're keeping the 12 instead of the 10. That 12 is where we stand. And we believe if you're going to actually follow the parameters, which this district office will, 12 is very sustainable. And it's actually doing staff a favor because if we're keeping you here, those are more days for you to put into your retirement bank. 
and you still have an opportunity to do those things that have to be done. And you don't get to pick every date on the calendar. If your child's competing in national competition and name your sport on a Friday in the middle of February, that's the date. They're not switching it for you. Go, do that, be with your family. Did anyone bring up, I mean, we just went from vacation to PTO when last year? Yes. Well, we went from sick days, personal days, days. emergency yeah. days to PTO. Yeah. But yes, your point's taken, yes. But like, didn't, didn't we say last year it was just kind of PTO? I mean, I guess my concern is, is if you give me 15 days off and a, a possibility for paid time off, are, are we going to use it at some point? That, that's been the precedent that's been set by some, but if the only reasons you're allowed to use it is for illness of you, a family member, or circumstances out of your control. And that's really not, that's, I, I kind of thought it was like we didn't really care if you got it in on we the didn't. time. We didn't, and that was unsustainable when we figured that out about October 1. Yeah, it was definitely a mistake made by all parties. And I'll take full credit for that mistake. Year. It did not work. It was not messaged correctly. It has been messaged correctly since basically November time, and it's been messaged consistently and correctly since. This would simply firm it up and make it real. But these are the rules we've sort of been following all along. I haven't granted a vacation since October. I haven't granted uh, circumstances out of your control exceptions since October. I mean, this is what we've been doing. Yeah, I think the beginning of the year was like rocky, right? And then it was. And then the message kind of went out that this is not sustainable. And then it's not. Um, it sounded like during the listening session that staff has done a, a much better job of reining back in. And um, I'll accept responsibility not. for it being poorly messaged. But what I will not accept responsibility for, if somebody has 12 days, simply taking those 12 days, I consider that to be unprofessional. Just because I have them, I'm going to use them. That's not me. That's not on me. That's on the individual employee. If I got 12 days and I know I get paid for them all, I'm going to bank them if I can. I'm not going to use them. But not everyone is going to do that. And that's not what some folks did. There are a whole bunch of folks that have got two, three, four left. We're in February. I've already had three meetings with people, three different people that have one and a half days left. And they've already been told you've got to be your perfect score the rest of the way. We need you here in front of the kids. That's what this is about. We need you here when the kids are here is uh i guess the other thing too is i mean just being a union member myself and when you put these changes in place um i forget the term you used jar was but it's gonna depth it's i mean it would bring some insecurities up for staffing and um can we really I, again i know you're putting time into this but like i don't want our staff to be frustrated worried and secured I want them to know what they're getting, and I want to look them in the eyes and tell them you're getting it. I, th I think we have done that with this document. If you look at the things that certified staff are receiving through this document versus things that are losing, I think the scorecard would have you see that it's a lot more they're getting than losing. Yeah, now remember, this: just these handbook changes do not take effect until the next contract year. So none of these changes would go into effect until July 1 of 2024. So what the current system that we're operating under is the the current handbook so this, these are not changes to that current handbook although the PTO time has been said that if you've now used you know all of your PTO you still have one strike two strike three strike so um, has that caused a little bit of concern for people because of certain situations that they took a bunch of PTO for vacation and then they got sick yes um, I'll say this, I've had three conversations with three different staff members. That those were all about four to six weeks ago. Not a one of them have missed a single day of school since. So you know, I would contend they can be here if they choose to be in most regards. If you're using 11 days in six, five, six months, that's an attendance problem. That's not good for your kids. You need to be here. No sub, no matter how good they are, is going to be as good as you. So we need you here. This gets people to be here better than what we presently have in place. And has this been gone, I mean, we're going over this every single year. Have we looked around, uh, I mean, is that something we can do, is do a study with other communities and exactly what, again, I just, I mean, I think everybody's fearful of change. And sure. especially with what they're gonna get paid or how their benefits. And I would just rather not have that stressor 
on our staff, I wouldn't like it. You know, mm -hmm. so um, to really put some time into this so we don't have to keep seeing a bunch of blue writing. I don't want to come back either. Time, we've spent a lot of time. Um, we are about one of five districts in CESA that are doing PTO. Uh, one of our neighbors, uh, their dialogue that you can put in the comments section of the survey said, do not adopt a PTO system unless you have really spe specific parameters for how it is used or you will have huge sub-issues. That, oh, that could have been us. That's basically what happened here. These parameters helped make that not happen. But in regards to time and transparency, I, I, can't, I, I don't know how the district office could be more transparent with, with certified staff about this. We've met repeatedly on this subject for three years. But I also reject that this was a district office creation. This has been created by a staff attendance problem, not by a sub problem. Some folks need to come to work more, and that's not everybody, some folks. Yeah, I was gonna, look, this is kind of like not driven by the district office so much as it is changes that's been driven by, first we saw that with the advisory, um, Council before you were on the board and we gave the personal days because that was something that was lobbied for by the advisory committee and said we are professionals please treat us as such um, we had a lot of great discussion about that you give people two personal days and they're gonna take them just because they're there because they can and it happened and then I think then that's when you got on the board and we had this discussion again like now we're in crisis mode in May because everybody says hey I still have a day left or two days left and I want to use them um, but that wasn't what the intent was so the intent seems to get lost sometimes and then they get used for other reasons which I, I can understand like you said if somebody gave me two days off and said they're paid go ahead and take them I would so that go happened. back to the first paragraph under PTO if you could please Becky that's the paragraph that I think has been lost in the shuffle certified staff are contracted to work a specific number of days each school year these required days of work include student contact days, in-service days, and days of parent-teacher conferences. It is the expectation of the School District of Amory that by signing a contract for employment, certified staff agree to work each of the required days and failure to do so is breach of contract. This hasn't changed. This has been in place for three years. Mm -hmm. The expectations never change. The idea that we have 12 PTO and we can use them however we see fit as 12 personal days that is A, unsustainable, and that's never been the message. That paragraph has not changed. We need people here when the kids are here. And if you can't be here because you're sick, your kid's sick, or you got something that's been scheduled and you've got to go, you get to go. I could give you example after example within the last two weeks of things that have been approved on blackout days, on days that they're not supposed to be able to do it. But they're, the answer has been yes every single time. And that was brought to the listening session um, as well. Yeah. That people had totally admitted that that was. Um, I don't think anybody's really missed anything of significant importance, right? I mean, kids' graduations, uh, weddings out of town. I'm not saying no. Right. So we we talked about that. But what am I going to say no to? Friday before spring break, I said no to the same person twice. I don't think that's I don't think that's a bad thing. Someone put in a request last week to do a hunting trip the two weeks before Thanksgiving, in the, in the middle of November they're gone for a whole week. That's a vacation. That's in your control. You don't have to go that week. That's bad for your kids. I said no. Were they pleased about that? No, but the answer was no, because we can't sustain that as a district. So offhandedly, what is our sub budget? Do we have an average of what, 10 a day? Sub well, here's our sub budget in financial in bigger numbers. Right. If every single staff person, and there's about 120 certified staff people in district, if every single person used one PTO, that's $16,500 to the district. If you multiply the 120 times the 130 it is for each day. If everyone uses two, that's 33,000. If everyone uses three, everyone uses four right now the average we're at district-wide is about five per person so five times sixteen thousand five hundred there's your eighty five thousand or so impact to the district budget so if we're interested in putting money back into the coffers this is a manner by which to do that because if it's 12 personal days and I'm going to use them I'm going to use them all that's not sustainable and yeah. and remember that that's just that hundred and thirty dollars a day is just paid to a different person but since it's paid time off, the person, the contracted staff member, 
if you're looking at a just a purely bargain basement forty thousand dollar a year contract that's about two hundred forty dollars a day so if you're talking two forty plus the one thirty that's three hundred and seventy dollars that we're paying for somebody to not be here and so no education is really happening probably depending on the sub for three hundred and seventy dollars for that day if you follow these rules I think we're gonna have a lot less problems and since we've been following them which is basically in the middle of November it has been a lot lot easier So that's a recommendation. Obviously, nothing you're voting on this evening. Blackout dates. Uh, the language here reads, blackout dates are for days on the school calendar for which no PTO is allowed. The district will maintain a PTO blackout date calendar that is accessible to all staff. Becky updates that when things change. It's the responsibility of all certified staff to check the PTO blackout date calendar prior to requesting time off to ensure that the requested date has not been blacked out. The district will determine blackout dates, which will include the following. So dates of parent-teacher conferences and in-service, which we already mentioned. Uh, dates before and after scheduled days off of school, like Christmas break or spring break. And then dates where we simply have too many folks gone and we're gonna have a shortage of subs. And we've blacked those dates out. Provisions, uh, PTO requests must be turned in seven days prior. So if you're doing something on that Friday, the, like the national competition for that uh, individual's uh, uh, student athlete, their child, they know about that date at the beginning of the season. They can turn that in well before the seven days. PTO request for sickness may be turned in prior to, the day of, or the day after, that you can't really control. Misrepresenting the reason for an absence is ground for, dis for discipline up to and including termination. District administrator will treat all unapproved absences as a leave without pay. District administrator will deny all PTO requests which do not follow the above guidelines. And district administrator has right to approve or deny all PTO requests. Unexcused absences, I believe, is the last batch of stuff, really. Uh, absences which occur on blackout dates without district administrator approval are considered unexcused and will be leave without pay. Staff will be docked per diem pay, which is daily rate of pay, for these unexcused absences. If an employee is absent on a blackout date due to illness, a doctor's note may be required. It's a simple process. There was a staff person that was gone two days last week, and it was Tuesday, Wednesday. Did not say a word to that person sitting in my inbox in my bin this morning was those two days of absences the forms filled out and stapled on the back was the doctor's note i never even talked to the person they were gone and covered and good to go uh pto retirement bank if you are a person uh that are that is here you're going to have uh, those days that you don't use put into your bank um then we have that breach of contract language again that comes back here that you saw prior. And then there's this clarity on the leave without, or the request for leave absence form. We simply want folks to get signature of their supervisor, turn that in, and uh, in the event of an unplanned uh, absence, the form should be turned in immediately thereafter. The form is for a sickness as well, so if you're sick, you could very well fill it out in advance. You fill it out when you get back. Um, I guess I just wanted to talk to the uh, board about the provisions that um, the last three uh, is, talks about the district administrator being the one who handles the approval. Um, I had heard some some mutterings and some uh, frustration of, but what if he approves this person because this person has got his ear and then I, I don't have his ear and I'm he's not going to approve me. Um, so just the, the, the thought of not being treated fairly depending on who you were or what it was for. Um, I actually threw out an idea and I think I actually discussed it with Sean too after our meeting that maybe he's not the one making these decisions, although it makes sense for him to make these decisions. Um, I actually, we talked about, we talked to staff as well that night at the listening session about that. Um, and so I just wanted to say that the staff's even though for every person that you hear like, well, maybe, you know, he's not treating people fairly. There was also the same person who said, when we kind of put it out there, maybe we have somebody else make that decision. And then the, the counter argument that the same person actually threw out there was, but I don't want somebody who doesn't approve anything. So um, I just wanted the board to be mindful of that, that we may hear things that people think that they're being treated unfairly or by who they are 
who it's who they are. Uh, but then they also don't want to put that into somebody else's hands because I think they know that Sean's been pretty fair in granting these requests. So, well, but if you follow what's what's written and you know eventually approved, right? If you follow within those guidelines, you might find a gray area where something falls out and you deal with it then. But yes, stay, my statement stay to the, the person guidelines. that wanted the Friday off before spring break was this: I can't approve this. You know I want to, and but I cannot. And you know why I can't. And they said to me, because everyone else will do it too. Exactly. I say that all the time. I don't. I can't set the precedent. I can't do it. So the last uh, pieces here on blue for certified staff, the PT, uh, oop, I did that already. PDH day trade. Um, the PDH day trade language remained the same. Um, if a person wants to do PDH, which is professional development hours, they can go ahead and do that and earn two additional paid PTO per school year cumulative up to four if uh, they want to do that. Um, PDH day trades are PTO days, so they follow the same guidelines. So you, even if you have a day that you can trade in, you still can't do it on a blackout day. You just need to pick a different day. And this was not what was proposed originally, This is not correct? what was proposed, and this is not what we saw on Wednesday of last week. This was district office in good, uh, good faith offering this to, be, to remain the same, and I believe it is the right thing to do. If people want to do professional development, that's a good thing, and this is an opportunity for folks. They're not cumulative up to four. Oh, they sorry. just earn two each year, and then two. they will go in their bank like their other days. Yes, not cumulative. I misspoke. And anything else? I can't remember, to be quite honest with you. Did you did jury duty again. Just do your civic duty. They want to see you, and there we go. Um, the bereavement leave, Yes. Uh, that blue language there, I think we did talk about this at the listening session and I asked to include niece and nephew. Okay. Could you please put that yes. back in, I don't think it was just made, I think it was just an oversight when you yep. redid this document, but if you could just make that. That we can do. Please. When you start defining family, it just sort of becomes impossible to get it right. I know, I just don't, I don't want this to end up somebody's niece or nephew and oh, God, yeah. God only knows that we end up with something like that. And yeah. well, it'll happen tomorrow if you don't put her in there. Yes. So the other documents mirror these. These are the support staff documents. The support staff handbook is very few changes as it always is. You've got the name changes on that second page there. So that is pretty easy. Um, There is some grievance language coming up here in a moment. You'll see some words that have been crossed out. Right? Nope, not there a little further. Or not. <laughs> it's there somewhere. It's there. Oh, let's do this one first. Personal vehicles, we've already covered that one. Oh, no, this is, yeah. Is this the certified staff or the support staff? This is the staff. Okay. I thought maybe you clicked on the wrong yeah. one. Did I miss it? You might have. Yeah, there's nothing in here. I don't see anything crossed off. Maybe it's not. What was the change? There was only that one change. There was one change. Go back up to grievance. Maybe we just didn't highlight it. Blue. You work on your dexterity moving the mouse. Oh, no, no. That's the vehicles. might be in the other document. I've looked at this so many times, I'm bleary out on it. Let's look at the other document and then we'll come back if need be. And I'll fish for it in the meantime too. The uh, next document you'll see, it is, um, has blue. There are columns as opposed to one big column like certified staff because there are various groups of employees in the district. So that first batch is clubhouse, custodian, school nutrition, para, and van drivers. So you'll see those, all of those wages pushed forward by a quarter. Remember last year to this year, everyone moved forward and everyone will move forward every single year. And this has them moving forward in addition to that. 
and the total cost of the growth that you see in each of the columns is about $125,000 if this is what we choose to do. Underneath bus driver, there's some other little items. Uh, bus driver sub rate pay changed, and then the training and meals, or training and meeting pay mirrors now the extra driving pay just for the ease of logistics in the <coughs> office so file it doesn't mix it up. It's now 18 for both. The position pay differential, school nutrition, there is a differential for cook and for school nutrition for lead cook, and also for um, up, uh, those, those are the ones there. And then when we get to the support staff longevity, I believe the longevity pay as written is about a pittance. $50 is a, a pittance. I mean, over 24 checks, that'd be $2 plus per check. So we're trying to make that a little bit more healthy, but you also don't want to get carried away. So those were the numbers that it was changed to. So that's the salary growth proposals there. And if you have questions or comments, the feel lead free. Cook, Excuse me? The lead cook um, pay differential. It, was that, I'm, I'm sorry, was that the recommended um, differential not, the night not, that we had the listing not session? Not quite. They were 150 and this is 125. What did you, what did you originally bring that at the listening session? Was it a dollar? Was it the dollar? Was that the original proposal or yeah, a dollar is what it is right now? A dollar 25 is what I brought. A dollar 50 is what they were interested in. Okay. And that's been, that was brought up straight through advisory committee, right through um, the school nutrition director Michelle Moore, and through one of those staff members in that department. So those would be the proposed increases there. Some of these changes will mirror what you just saw. So moving forward, you're going to get carpal tunnel syndrome by the end of this. So there's the in lieu of here of $2,000, the in lieu of payment for married couples, mirrors what we just talked about. We took out, that should be in blue, that uniform language. It simply became nondescript and not understood, so we simply removed it. We were going to give a stipend from folks that work primarily outdoors, so we didn't have folks that were really primarily outdoors other than folks that work playground aids. Uh, we had a bus driver made a, a pitch for that, uh, but you're not outdoors if you're a bus driver. You're in the bus, and it's ironic, the bus driver that made that pitch, actually, I saw the next day, in short sleeves driving a bus. So that's not really an outside job. Um, there was also a pitch from a nighttime custodian, but nighttime custodians typically don't do snow removal. That's typically a daytime custodian. So that was denied as well. So that's what the language was taken up. Simply it was not being used and it was not understood. The PTO language, there are a couple of changes here. That second paragraph looks similar to the par second paragraph we just saw. <coughs> sickness, sickness of family member, and then in circumstances out of your control. And then you'll see again, the same, literally exact same words for what is allowed, what isn't allowed, the provisions. There simply isn't a lot of teeth in the support staff uh, coming to school, coming, coming to work uh, provisions and we're seeking to firm that up because we need them here too. If you take someone out of a team of four in a, in a, in a kitchen, a team of three's gotta pick up the pieces for the fourth person and that is a big hardship. We need folks here because there are not a lot of subs for any of these positions. So this looks similar to that language. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them or comments, you certainly can do that too. If not, we can move on. Um, up here you see uh, separation of employment language. Um, employees may not use more than the number of PTO. That language has been cut out. We simply replaced it with the language that you see there, more concise. Uh, there are seven days prior to the date of a vacation, not the day before. So you need to let us know you're going. This was a big point of contention, so much so that I got an email early afternoon today, uh, bereavement leave. They felt it unfair that support staff did not have bereavement leave because bereavement happens for them too. So this is entirely new and I believe it's the right way to go because things happen for them. 
Uh, bereavement, remember, isn't just funeral. You might have a funeral to attend, but it may not be local. You might have to travel, so the day there, the funeral visitation, and all that stuff, and then the day back, I mean, you're covered then, so to speak. You don't have to use your PTO, because there's a concern. I don't have PTO, but I gotta go to this funeral. I understand, you gotta go. So we put that in. Does it say, I, I, I read some of this, but I, I don't remember reading this part. This, do, those this, brief, do those bereavement days have to be consecutive? No. It does not, but it, but it might be three is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yep. It might be a circumstance like that. But you could have a bad year and have three funerals. I mean, that well, but I know like if you were dealing with the death of a parent, it, there might be a reason that you have to go to the courthouse or there might be a reason yep. you have to, you know, and then all you're fall a, in line, right? Absolutely, and then you're ending up in an FMLA boat where you're covered and then yeah. some. I mean, you just got, you got to be a part of that. You right. got to do that thing. Add the niece and nephew to that one as well. I'm sure nephew. that was a cut and paste thing there, but niece and nephew to that one too, please. Uh, PDH trade that remains the same. Simply the note to look at the PTO use guidelines. Jury duty, we've been there, done that. And then a word change the schedule, or then a date at the end. The item that I'm making reference to with grievance policy, and for some reason I'm not seeing it highlighted here, but I haven't had a chance to focus as we're, we're doing this, is it uh, the language stated that uh, uh, suspensions, write-ups, and those types of things are not eligible for the grievance process. So we're going to look at the new grievance process in May and June, but that language has been deleted because that is exactly what I'm treating as a grievance because we've had folks suspended, we've had folks written up, and they've grieved. They've said, no, I don't agree, here is why. So we're not following that language, so let's get rid of that language. They should have an opportunity as an employee to be heard, to state, no, this is what occurred, not that. In the old language, they can't say a word. <coughs> that doesn't seem in keeping with due process. So I don't know even know why that was there, to be honest with you. It's probably a vestige of the past. But yeah, yeah they can grieve that. Yeah, I think it's just good that we make sure that those documents all match um, yes. for, that, for that reason. So those say, are the four documents. Oh, I would just say that the listening session um, committee met that night, and there was only two support staff members that um, came to that meeting, which was kind of odd. One was sick. One, all, or I think she was sick, right? Yes. One yes. was one, never missed. Yes, one was never missed, was, was ill that yeah. night. Um, but yeah, there was only a couple, but that's usually when you have a representative yeah. from each division. Yeah, it was maybe a little light on the support staff, but the... Um, Certified staff was probably the largest turnout we've ever had, and I think was, yeah. I'm looking at a few of the people that were there, and I think was hopefully pretty positive, I think. Um, I guess if so. just people are wondering, like if, you know, if you guys are wondering like why there hasn't been that much discussion that's happened with the support staff languages and, and what's proposed here, um, we didn't, we simply didn't hear much um, from them in that listening session to bring back to, to this. A, above and beyond what was presented mm -hmm. that, that evening. So I guess that's why I was quiet going through that. I will say from a personal standpoint, and I know I've said this before, and I don't say it because I'm compelled to or I just want to be redundant, I appreciate the opportunity to meet with certified staff and support staff to talk about salary and benefits. It isn't always the, the most <coughs> fun stuff, and it isn't always a place in which we agree on all things. There's been tough conversations. But their input's been very valuable. I have said this since it occurred. I, I thoroughly disagree the manner by which Act 10 occurred. I think it was very disrespectful to teachers. And I think they need to have a voice because their voice matters as much as any. Because after all, they're making this thing happen every day. That is education. It, it ain't me, I can tell you that. We need them and we need to treat them accordingly. And the, the standing rules have always been treat them fairly and equitably. And I believe this document does that by and large, but we also have to balance budget. I'd love to give them the, the CPI out of the state, I think was 5.1. I'm sure they would like to meet tomorrow and talk about 5.1. I get that, but we got to balance the budget. So it's been a very good relationship when we've been doing this now for four years and we'll continue to do so. I thank Char and Dale for sitting with us on that evening. It was a late night. It was well past Dale's bedtime. So it was. It was. It was. So <laughs> next week we'll have to have snacks to keep everyone bright. No ice yeah. cream either that night. It's too late for ice cream. <laughs>
I have, I have two questions. One, yes, one that's ahead. in on, on the topic of this, and one that's outside yes. that topic. Yes. Um, I think of our policy at my place of work, where bereavement, the days of bereavement available fluctuate depending on who the individual is that passed. Okay. So the case of, of a parent or a child, you get more days than if it's okay. an aunt or an uncle. My question is, do you have, um, and I'm assuming this is the case, do you get spillover of that into the PTO days if there's more you days required to. for that, right? Yeah, if you got to. And then the other question that's outside of that is in the topic of, of WRS and retirement, mm -hmm. and you mentioned other things they could invest in or sure, every uh, every employee has the opportunity to invest in a 403B and a 457. And That's who manages choice. those? We manage those in, in house, but they we simply get from them what their said number of dollars they want to deposit into those accounts. Payroll is really where it ends. What they choose to do in that area is, is their choice. How much money or how little money? That's entirely theirs. No, I I, I so the reason I'm asking that question because. I'm extremely frustrated with WRS, and I don't know how the other individuals feel about it, but everybody should be able to log in and see their account and see where they're at so they can plan for the future. You are not and, alone. And I and that is like something I want to drive, and I don't know that I can ever get anywhere. But WRS is a bit Fort Knox-like, if you hadn't noticed. I, should, I, I almost, I should, I thought about it after I, met with the governor the other day and I was like, I totally forgot to ask him that. <laughs> he probably doesn't know. No. He probably can't get into his <laughs> He probably can't get into his either. He gets a statement once a year just like all the rest yeah. of us. Yeah. I do know that Twyla has had conversations oh, about yeah. looking at our four fifty seven and our four oh three Bs and are we, you know, providing that the best possible benefit um, for the extra benefits. That are, you, are you using a different they're a non WRS provider, right? The, Correct. So somebody yeah. that, that does give people the ability to log in. And, and so then is there a, a marketing push to get those teachers to invest in their own retirement? Because that's there is. huge. I met with uh, all uh, new staff uh, about three weeks ago, and I do that every single year. And we do a financial literacy piece, Twyla and I. And we go through the math of that every, every time. And if you want, we have a former marketing teacher in the room that taught business said the power of cumulative growth by percentage over time Huge. is enormous. But not everyone sees it that way. Okay. Um, in addition to you know encouraging staff to invest on their own, wherever they choose, uh, we also do have some classes that we've offered on how to configure what your WRS retirement will be based on the formulas. Of course, there's lots of different choices that you can take. Um, they do have classes around the state that you can also go to when you get closer to. But um, I know uh, Josh Ganji and, and Twyla, and I think that they have led some classes that have been very in, uh, informative for staff to, to kind of get a look at it. A lot of staff may kind of think about it but they, until they go there and then really see. Um, yeah, well, and I recognize that I'm kind of the exception because I'm looking at mine every day. Yeah. But I think that if you don't have a, the ability to view it, Mm -hmm. How can you plan? You can do your 403B and your 457 with much greater ease. That's good to hear. Yes. Jeez, Steve, tell me you want out of your job without telling me you want out of your job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Every day. Not every day. You got to plan for the future. Well, your boss must be a real PIA. Yeah. He's a <laughs> All right. Follows me everywhere I go. Mine too. I know. Mine too. So you'll see these, you'll see these with these suggestion changes. Um, again next month, the month of March. Uh, we always do two readings and then you can weigh in at that time and vote however you see fit. Okay, we'll move to our action items and we did the resolutions. We have so, a new high school English course and Jessica and Josh are going to walk us through that. At our K-5 Curriculum Oversight <coughs> Committee meeting for science, Mr. Gould and Mr. Nick Stewart joined us and proposed and informed us on a new course that they are seeking to add at the high school. The course title is Literature and Sports. You can see the prerequis prerequisites are English 9, English 10. Um, Mr. Stewart has taught this before, so he has walked us through it, and you can see on the documentation uh, we talked about the alignment of the state standards, the course objectives, as well as the course content. 
and assessments. It was a healthy dialogue. There were some, some great questions by our Curriculum Oversight Committee. Um, and any questions that you have, hopefully, Mr. Golder, I could answer those for you. <coughs> I can share a little bit. Just Mr. Stewart said he had good success with this coursework in the past, just some of the more reluctant writers or readers. This was a great way to encourage and engage students in the process of writing. This is the one that Josh was looking for when he was in high school. Just didn't happen. <laughs> didn't have AI either, did they? <laughs> <laughs> Josh wouldn't do that. All right. So this would like require an option. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this would have, you know, um, grabbed my attention. Obviously, I think um, this is probably even I, I'm hoping that this doesn't fall to the wayside of like, well, I have to be in sports and actively like, you know, be a participant for kids to take this because I think it's um, fantastic. This is something that's kind of a lifelong, um, you know, these obviously these incorporate lifelong skills um, into um, thinking and then it, actually like some uh, career um, introduction with background of journalism and sports writing and um what a what a great uh, interpersonal communications doing an interview where you actually have to talk to someone yes um which is what a great avenue to go into these days i think when i think of like the digital age and how everybody wants to you, the, the old goal used to be to break onto the radio or break onto a you know an espn but man that there's just so much more out there now with people running their own youtube channels and their own tiktok accounts and this would be just be that great introduction of different avenue streams instead of the old basic standby sports journalism stuff now. I think that's why it's really starting to um, hit on career topics there. So I think it's a great, great course. So we need a motion. I'll make a motion we approve yep. the new high school English course. Yes. I'll second it. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? There we go. And I want to go take it. <laughs> I'll go crazy. Okay, we've nice got. We passed right. that line yeah. already. Yeah. We passed that. Oh gosh. We have grants and donations, and so the titles changed a little bit. We have some new additions here via grants as well. Uh, thank you to the Polk Burnett Co-op for a fifteen hundred dollar Operation Roundup grant. The funds will be used to install electricity in a future animal outbuilding at the school farm. Compere financial grant, $5,000 will be used for improving land access to the programs at the school farm. Sand County Foundation grant, thank you for $1,500 grant, which will be used to build a pollinator garden at the school <coughs> farm. Uh, Mike Sathra, thank you for your donation of drill bits, taps, and dies, and the end mills for the AHS Construction Academy. And thank you for your generosity and support. We'll need a motion to accept those grants and donations. Make a motion we accept those donations with many thanks. Steve in a second. 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 Joe. All in favor say aye. 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 An easy one. CTE program hit him up good. <laughs> uh, with that, we have personnel and you want to put it up? All right, yeah. personnel. We've got new employment and extracurricular contracts for uh, Christy Bade for special ed para. Kelly Belisle, long-term sub and band. She's presently student teacher, moving into long-term sub. Deanna Johnson, can't stay away apparently. She's coming in to do a long-term sub as school psych. Olivia Peters, JV volleyball coach. Hannah Robinson, special ed para. Rick Eiserman, JV boys golf coach. Reassignments. Uh, from IS Secretary and Enrollment Reporting Coordinator to District Data and Enrollment Coordinator, Aaron Osero. Resignations, uh, effective end of year, for Dana Prindle in Special Ed as a Teacher, and Miranda Verhayen, Middle and High School French Teacher. Matt Ziegler, JV Football Coach, and then Retirements for Julie Hyden as an Office para at the Middle School, and Kevin Olson, Art Teacher. And if you could uh, humor me, I have a couple of remarks from yes. Julie and Kevin in regards to retirement. And Tom or whoever else wants to speak can certainly do so. 
Um, the numbers are a little shocking. Julie says, uh, I have lived in Amory all of my life. I was hired in the fall of 1984 for the school district, uh, Amory School District. I was in eighth, eighth grade. Okay. Some of my favorite memories are celebrating all of the special days at middle school, dressing up, dancing, and spending fun times with students and staff. The one thing I did learn is that you may not think you make a difference, but years later they will tell you that you did. I am looking forward to spending more time with my husband, family, and friends. I will have more time for crafting and cooking, and I really look forward to not having to set an alarm. <laughs> and by my math, that's 40 years. If you do 84 to 24, that's 40 years. So, Julie Hyden. She was there before you. Yeah, she was. And uh, Julie's been working with me in the office every year I've been here. Um, just a wealth of knowledge. She knows everybody. She knows all the reasons that certain things happened. Um, and uh, I just love it. every time something happens, and usually it's me doing something that she doesn't like, and she looks at me and she goes, Really? And she gives me a <laughs> <day>. Really? <laughs> so I get scolded quite a bit. But, um, so we'll miss Julie. She's a, a phenomenal lady. All right. Kevin Olson. Oops, sorry. Uh, well, if, Julie, if Julie thinks that she's going to spend more time with her husband, she's going to have to get less to, co to quit working too. <laughs> <laughs> Unless she's going to go hang out at the scrapyard with them. But <laughs> thanks to Julie. Boy, she's just been a staple for a long, long time. All right. Kevin's answers. Number of years in education uh, in Amory Education, put in one. I've been teaching for 41 years. The last 38 in Amory, three years in Claremont and West Concord, Minnesota. Favorite memories. He notes. I've really enjoyed teaching and coaching here in Amory. I love running into my students, past and present, out in the community and saying hello. It seems the relationships we start them when they were kids just go on and on. I like that. It's been fun watching my students find success in art and playing tennis or other sports. I'd have to say watching and sometimes even coaching my own kids in conference, sectional and state tennis tournaments was certainly thrilling. What are you looking forward to in retirement? More than anything, I'm looking forward to spending more time with my wife, Nancy. I'm looking forward to morning walks on school days and trips to national parks off season when I would normally have been in the classroom. I'm looking forward to playing with the grandkids, visiting friends and family around the US and figure out how I can continue to make a difference in people's lives. So Kevin Olson. And, and again, there, I, I, he was on the interview committee when I was hired, uh, just the, the salt of the earth. <laughs> when there's ever a, a problem with a student, with staff, you can look for Kevin, and he always kind of calmly just co and collectively will give you the other side point. You know, let's look at it from this viewpoint. Uh, he is um, amazing to work with. Everyone... Um, in, in the building uh, just loves him, so he's going to be missed dearly. And I think if you, know, you think of anyone that's been through in 41, 38 years that he's been here, just about everyone you know has had Kevin for art. So. And he said one of my very favorite things about Tom, he said, don't worry if you miss an email from Tom, there's going to be another one coming soon. <laughs> 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 All well, well, school staff apparently <laughs> Five more. I just I like everything done yesterday type of guy. You, know? you got you wanted to cover. Okay, I got it. I remember running into him when my kid was one of my kids was taking art and I'm like, You're still here? <laughs> <laughs> and you look the same. Good but for him. Great guy. Yeah. Well, yes. I wasn't fortunate enough to attend Amory <coughs> School District, but um, every time that I walked into schools I wish I was because I can I struggle to draw stick figures. And I look at what my kids were able to, so they certainly didn't get any artistic ability from me. And I look at what my kids were able to do in middle school art. Um, I, all you have to do is walk into that building and see some of the stuff that's hanging on the walls. And it, it never ceases to just blow my mind uh, how these art teachers, our music teachers can just get that talent out of kids and just drive them. What they can draw, what they can paint, what they can visualize and, and hang up is just incredible. So I wish she had been my teacher. Yeah. 
and that's personnel. Perfect. So before a vote, I will be recusing myself from this. We're going to go into closed session is what I'm hoping to do because we have some other things to discuss and then when we come out we will vote on personnel issues. Okay. okay. So can I get a motion to go to close? A motion. Joe? And a second? Second. So, all right. Oh, I didn't do the community comments. Was there any? Oh, yeah. I don't know. Not. None? Yeah, not. Okay. I'm, no. All right. And who second? I did. Sharp. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. We're in close. Thank you much for